three, two, one. Hey, Martin, how are you doing? I'm good, Jay. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How's your morning going? Uh, fine. Yeah? Nothing, nothing terribly special. Wife is out shopping. Very exciting. That was very exciting. How are the kids and everyone doing? They're good. Francis started um, driver's ed this week, oh, wow. um, uh, which is on Zoom, which is kind of cool. And Zoom? Then, really? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, through Walt Whitman High School. And then for the in-person part, she gets one-on-one -on -one instruction from Montgomery County police officer. How does that go, like doing driver's ed over Zoom? I think it's just like, well, it's just like all the school that they did the last uh, half of the year or so. It's all just, you know, the teacher's there and it's live and they can obviously show the videos or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I remember when I went to Whitman and did it, the classroom was just a classroom. There was no technology there. And then when we drove, we drove in groups of three kids and one instructor. So in that sense, I can't imagine when I did, obviously I did it a long time ago. I can't imagine it's any different for her. Um, you know, she's getting the, you know, wear the seatbelt and don't get in a car with someone that's been, you know, drinking or, I mean, I, you know, I don't know what you can really learn other than that it's a real summer school class. So the, she has to do like three hours a day for a bunch of weeks. Cause it's supposed to, it equals out a semester of school year. And then she's also doing a health class, um, which a lot of kids knock out in summer school so they can take more uh, an extra AP class during the school year. So she's actually in school for like six hours a day. I think maybe for a month. Yeah, but I don't know what's going on. She doesn't seem to mind. I think she misses. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with the schooling. Like, is it going to open up in August? What's going on? Well, I think there's three choices, right? either well two choices either they go they do M montgomery county was very successful right not every place was uh, in virginia there are kids that lost a whole semester um in fairfax i want to say so yeah it'll either be um that she'll go every other day and with half the kids and then she'll be online every other day and i don't see how that can work because you only have the same amount of teachers you can't double their hours, but that's option one. And option two is to just do it all on Zoom. I think, you know, I'm a glass half full guy, but with everything ticking upwards, which it is, and I think it's just gonna snowball. In the next four to eight weeks, I think we're looking at, the, I think the whole country, you're looking at school online. I'd be, I'd be very surprised if she was physically in, in and my son either. Um, I don't want that to be true. But I think we're at the beginning of all this and um, people think it's the middle or the end and it's not. It's just the very beginning. And again, I don't want to be right and, you know, great if someone invents something tomorrow. But I think, you know, I think she'll be in physically in school year from September. If I had to bet on it, that's what I would, well, both my kids, that's what I would bet. It's not the best for them. But the flip side of that coin is when I was growing up, there was none of this technology. So, you know, there really would be like no school or it would be dad school. So, you know, it all is what it is. And I don't have a crystal ball. I'm just, just taking an educated guess. Do you think they're going to do like a hybrid version, you know, little in class, a little at home? Do you think that's the kind of model they might lean towards? Well, that's what they want to do, but I don't think it's going to work out. But also Montgomery County is very smart in that they have, since 9-11, they had um, plans in place for all of this, right? Which most places did not. But they were very smart about it in that they didn't reveal their decision about what was going to actually happen, even though they already knew, to one to two days before it happened. And the reason for that is very simple. Um, Montgomery County parents uh, sue the school system all the time because <laughs> they're not happy, right? And um, that's just an incredibly common occurrence. So um, this way they don't have, give people time to think about and file. Um, like for instance, when my daughter went to a temporary school while they were rebuilding her school, there were a whole bunch of parents that were on the verge of taking the county to court. Really? So this is very common. Well, yeah, very, very, it's kind of 
people that are not used to hearing no. And um, yeah, so uh, if, if you, if you, you want an, another career where you, you know you'll always work, just go to law school and then study uh, education law and then set up uh, your shingle in Montgomery County, you'll be very successful. We actually know the guy who does that, who's like, he's the number one lawyer in Montgomery County for um, suing the county. And at this point, if he sues the county, the county just settles. They don't bother going to court because for so many years, he's never lost. Now he won't take anything, right? He won't take something frivolous. He does a lot of um, special ed, special needs kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, his name is, well, it's Jonathan Igg's brother, because I know the, the brother who is a screenwriter, and I'm trying to remember, the, but it's Igg, and he's in Chevy Chase, and yeah, it's very funny that the county doesn't even bother to go to court anymore. <laughs> he files, they just, yeah. So, welcome to Montgomery County. But, you know, my kids will grow up and go into the world, and it'll all be okay. I mean. That's crazy, though. Um, everything that's going on with the schooling and everything. How do you think, um, you know, we met a little bit about our relationship. I took one of your classes, um, a weekend class, and uh, I, I really liked how you made the environment very um, safe, you know, between actors and you as our teacher. And I really appreciated that. And then I found out you did one-on-one -on -one schooling for acting and uh, I, I took your classes. Um, but now everything that's going on with coronavirus, how do you see the entertainment industry playing out and what's going to happen because cases are going up now? Like what is, you know, you have such a, you've been in the industry for so long. You have such an interesting point of view and perspective. How do you think things are going to be playing out in the next couple of months? Do you think things will ever really get back to the way they were talking about specifically in New York or LA, those big hubs with a lot of people squished together. Like, how do you see that playing out? Well, how, and well, I mean, that's sort of, there are many answers to your excellent question. And um, thank you for um, um, saying that I create a safe environment. It's really important to me to do that as a teacher. Um, entertainment business, well, I think, uh, at some point, this virus is going to go away. Um, you know, there will be a vaccine and there's going to be, it's, it'll be sort of uh, on steroids, not unlike when there's a Writers Guild strike and everything shuts down. Um, there'll be a stockpile of material that'll have been written. Um, and that will mean that um, Hollywood um, will go into production sort of over time. Um, uh, to make content. Um, uh, right now, uh, Netflix and Amazon are having a, a challenge, which is um, they're as big as their libraries are, they're running out of content. People are exploring those libraries. And um, at the same time, obviously, movie theaters are shut. Um, there was some talk uh, before all this, uh, because movie theater, the movie theater model was sort of in trouble that, which makes perfect sense that Amazon was going to buy, um, God, it, it used to be called um, Cineplex, and now what's the big company? EMC. Owns, yeah, they're going to buy MC. Okay. And so therefore, they can put their movies on a big screen and not have to hassle with distributors over whether or not they can do that. And because Amazon doesn't need to necessarily make a profit, and it feels like they're in the entertainment business half for the fun of it. And same with Netflix. I could see that really happening. So I, I think the, the long-term answer is within a year, year and a half, you're going to get all your TV shows back. You're going to get movies, and you're going to see Amazon, which is just such a win-win for them by most of the movie screens in the United States. And also what's fascinating right now is that um, you can go see movies in Walmart parking lots in your car, yeah. um, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, but the film industry has always faced challenges and come back from them like television. Everyone said when television came to be, the film business was gonna you know, go away and it didn't. Um, 
So, and that's happened many times. So I think in the sort of next five to 10 years, uh, within a year, I think, and listen, I'm, I don't track this, I don't live in LA, but I feel like it'll go back to quote normal. And then I feel like in the next sort of 10 years, what you're gonna see is less film and maybe less television to a degree. Um, it's the golden age of TV right now with so many shows. And I think you're going, we're going to move towards um, people, um, my kids' generation and younger, and they're going to want to do video games where it's completely interactive, where they, as the main character, can talk and will get lines of dialogue back, which is sort of there now in a more automated way, where they have choices of things to say. Um, but I think like the way I'm wearing a headphone, I think you're going to play a video game. Like I was watching my daughter last night play a Star Wars game where she was fighting stormtroopers for like two hours, which is the length of a movie, right? Yeah. But she's the hero. Yeah. You know, and so she gets the adrenaline of being in that point of view from the audience of actually being the main character fighting all these battles. So... I would think that there'll be a sort of mix of story with different, you know, um, possible, you know, you keep hitting these whys where you can make a choice that already exists and that'll take you down a different path story-wise. But I think eventually you're gonna, you're gonna, well, hey, I think, um, I mean, this is a big conversation. Um, I think uh, uh, the VR glasses are coming. I think Apple's gonna make them. And I think that, um, you're going to have kids that are, you're literally going to have the experience of being the hero in a movie. Yeah. And so, and then you can be in a scene with the, your favorite movie star. Yeah. If technology gets to a point, because what you're saying with Apple, I completely agree with. I think I was reading somewhere in 2022, maybe 2023, they're going to come out with AR versus VR. AR is augmented reality. That's right. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to have glasses with augmented reality. So you're at an airport and you don't know you're at O'Hare airport and you've never been there. And it'll basically say, take a right to get, and you'll basically see the real world, but then you'll see like an arrow on some glasses that you're wearing saying, take a right to get to your terminal. So I think that's definitely the next big hardware change coming. You know, Apple revolutionized the game with the iPod and then the iPhone. And I think the next big thing is going to be those glasses. And then every Microsoft, Google, they're all going to follow suit. Uh, it's very interesting when you talk about having virtual reality. Now, I think that is really insane to think about. If you could be in a movie with say, uh, you could be in like a virtual reality, um, and you're with your favorite actors going through a scene and you're the protagonist, that would be very revolutionary because then it's combining the entertainment world with movies and television and that whole scene with video games. And I've actually never heard someone say it like that. And right now, as you're saying it, I could definitely see that coming in the next 10, 20 years. Um, I think that would be it a great collaboration between the video game industry and the entertainment industry. But do you actually think Amazon will go and buy AMC theaters? Why wouldn't they? It's, it's just such, such a smart business move on their part. It's the old, it, it's not that they're, well, think about what you could do if you were Amazon. The first thing I would do if I was Amazon with all those great big physical spaces, which they don't really have, they're starting with some bookstores and, you drew a pickup and Whole Foods and, but think about it. You could have lockers where you could pick up your Amazon deliveries when you went there. You could have a Starbucks. They could team up with Starbucks at that location. Um, you could have uh, certain very popular Amazon items like their batteries and stuff. They could have kind of like a store area. And then the other thing that they can do, because of course movie theaters really ultimately make their money off of concessions, is I would take all those movies in the Amazon Prime catalog and I would just have like a different movie in multiple theaters, different uh, for a dollar. I would do dollar movies, right? Mm -hmm. So you can pay your $15 to see the new Batman or you could pay a dollar and see Dark Knight. Yeah. 
and then you know every every because it's all digital you know every three hours or every two hours it could be a different movie 24 7 and then times the multiple screens or you could get it where enough people reserve or request a certain title that could be on a screen on demand for a dollar and again that would get the physical foot traffic as, as real estate uh, commercial real estate people talk about um, in there and then you know they can make a gazillion dollars on popcorn and candy and there can be Amazon brand movie candies and by Amazon popcorn I can it makes a lot of sense for them, um, I, I think, because it's sort of the best of both worlds. They get the, all that physical real estate. They get it cheap, right? Because what what's movie theater real estate worth these days to the way the movie business is going? And um, they can turn it into a multi-use space that all flows into all things Amazon. So maybe you could go there, you could watch your movie, and in two hours, your Amazon order from the warehouse could be at the location. That's a really interesting perspective in having different movies. So when I think of a movie theater, a traditional movie theater, I'm going to go and see new releases. But you had the idea of putting up other movies, older movies. How would you, let's say you're an executive for Amazon and you're spearheading that movement and you're going to now be a part of the I don't know what division it is the let's call it the entertainment division of Amazon and it's your job to make the decision on buying AMC and going to brick and mortar um, down that route of brick and mortar stores and having um, a theater and then all the new releases of Amazon movies are going to be shown there at first um, but how would that business work? Would it be a subscription basis or would you, because right now when I buy from Amazon, I have Amazon Prime. So I'm giving them money annually to get their services. To use their movie theater, how would I, would I have to go and pay a dollar now for a movie? Would I have to pay $14 for a new movie? Or would it like, would my um, Prime subscription now increase if I wanted to utilize this part of the business? How would you think about approaching that um, whole business model if Amazon went in that route and acquired um, AMC theaters, which I believe said last I heard they're going to go bankrupt before yeah. they can open up. Um, so they could get it dirt cheap. But I also, from what I'm understanding of that movie theater industry, the margins are re razor thin. But you have a very interesting perspective on that. How would you spearhead that if you were running Amazon in that division? Well, the answer would be, you know, Amazon are the all-time genius at efficiency and figuring out what, what people want and where they want it. So they're very good at modeling that. And um, I think you would just, you would just do studies and I think you would build a, um, I think you would just take uh, one movie theater and build a test with different models and try different things and over time Amazon is very good at adjusting so I don't think you would know instantly how to do it any more than Amazon when they first opened their doors instantly knew how to do it but I think they're very good at just paying attention to what and uh, harvesting information about customer behavior and I think they're very good at maximizing because their margins are thin let's face it but they're still you know making a gazillion dollars so I, you know, I think that they would, they would um, try different things. And I think you could show studio movies as well. Um, I think, um, yeah, you would just try different, you would just try different um, ways. I would imagine maybe you, if you weren't a prime member, you might have to pay like a, a couple bucks to walk in the door kind of a thing. But I feel pretty confident that if Amazon were to go down that road, A, they would have goals in place about how they want it to work and B, because they've been wanting brick and mortar, right? Not like in a, in a mall way that's, that's not efficient, but in a very efficient way. So I would just say build a couple test centers at two or three places around the country and change it up, keep trying things, you know, beta test. Um, see what you survey people pay them to come in and try it out and you know fill out surveys they'll, they'll, they'll they're pretty smart about that stuff so it's more i think a company like amazon 
it's more a matter of not what they can do, it's what they want to do at this point. And since they've said they want to get into a more brick and mortar presence, and they've been complaining forever that, that um, the movie theaters won't carry their movies, and they're sitting on infinite cash, essentially. And you're right, these, this stuff is all going to go for fire. So, I mean, even as a real estate investment for them, it's a pretty smart play. But it's not, you know, it's not, it's thousands of screens, but it's not hundreds of thousands. So, you know, I, I, I don't see how they can, I mean, I'm not, I, listen, if you can hook me up with, with Jeff at Amazon, I'd be more than happy to go to work for him to implement this. But I, I, it's just such an obvious fit for them based on what they're stating. And I think people would love it because, you know, let's say I want to buy, I don't know, a, a new keyboard for my laptop. So I could go and I could even, I know I'm going to that movie theater, right? So I know I'm going to go see a movie at eight o'clock and it's now four o'clock and I could order my keyboard. And then, you know, six hours later when my movie is over, the keyboard would be waiting for me. Plus I would, you know, free right there. It's almost like, you know, now they do stuff where I get stuff that sometimes I buy and they have it um, delivered overnight or within four hours already. So you go to your movie and you leave with your shopping bag that says Amazon on it, of course, and you see your movie and you have your popcorn and maybe you get a Starbucks coffee. And I feel like they could, they could have some real synergy together. Um, not unlike with Whole Foods, I think it'd be great for Starbucks as people uh, say, you're in Starbucks. Oh, I've got some time. Maybe I'll watch a movie. Oh, let me look and see on my, on my iPad what movies are playing. Oh, there's something I'd like to see. It starts in 10 minutes. It's a buck. And then, oh, while I'm here, why don't I order that book I've been wanting and it'll be here by the time the movie's over. I mean, I could just, you could just sort of see how that would beautifully integrate. And with the scale that Amazon has, how they can make that all work and how so much of the infrastructure to make all of that work is in place. So it's synergy, right? How would you like, see, would anyone step in and stop? Because Amazon is so big right now. And if they take over movie theaters, like let's say Paramount Pictures or Warner Brothers wants to put movies in movie theaters, but now Amazon owns all the AMCs. So now it's limited to is Warner Brothers or Paramount going to be able to put their movies in Amazon theaters? You know what I'm saying? Yes, yeah, sure. So Warner Brothers, all these movie companies have a problem, right? Which is that the, um, the, the, the money that they're making on screens in the United States is kind of going away anyway, right? So they're making their money off of DVDs and they're making their money off of international film sales, particularly China, ever growing. So I think in an odd way, if, if Amazon would play nicer than the movie studios have played with them, it could, again, you would want to think of it as a win-win. You'd want to say to, to Warner Brothers, hey, we can get all this foot traffic. People have an extra reason to come in and see a movie. And, you know, let's make this successful for everyone at the, at the table. Um, I, don't, I don't say, I mean, you know, it used to be that movie theaters, uh, movie studios originally owned movie theaters, right? Mm -hmm. That was just true at the beginning of movies. And then there were antitrust laws created, and I'm not gonna remember when, but at some point in the 50s maybe. But at some point antitrust laws came in and movie theaters could no, uh, movie studios could no longer physically own movie theaters, right? Mm -hmm. And that was the law of the land since you were a kid. And at some point, I think that changed and they can own a certain amount of screens again. Uh, but to your antitrust, I mean, you know, Amazon is ripe for antitrust going after it. And I don't feel like uh, adding movie screens is going to be the tilting point, you know? Yeah. I, I think if enough politicians and people that vote them in office want that. But the flip side of that coin is everyone loves it. And I don't know people that don't like Amazon. So uh, you know, I don't know how you break them up. And uh, if you're Amazon, you just pull a Microsoft, right? And you just start giving a, a large portion of what you're making, which you're never going to spend anyway to charity. And then you don't get broken up. I mean, that's the only, I mean, I'm sure Bill Gates and his wife 
um, are happy to give people a zillion dollars, but it's also true they didn't really start doing it in a big way until it looked like there was going to be antitrust against Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden now there's, you know, so um, he credits his wife for turning him around and thinking differently about uh, giving, which is great and God bless. So, you know, if someone wants, if there are people that are motivated to shut Amazon down now, or do antitrust and break them up like they did with AT&T, that's going to happen. And I don't, I don't, as much as entertainment is a big part of our lives, um, I don't think this would be like a tipping point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazon is very interesting because with current legislation, you have to own more than 50% of the market share, but Amazon isn't only in one market, nor do they contain, from what I understand, more than 50% of one market, but they're close. So they're kind of teetering on that line. So it's like in Congress, how do you write litigation to come after Amazon and break them up when they're kind of being very avoiding the law in such a unique way? And you've never seen an enterprise like Amazon where they're touching everything. And I'm just so curious behind Jeff Bezos and like he started small with a bookstore and eventually became bigger and bigger and bigger and started taking bigger bets like AWS, which is their biggest moneymaker by far. Um, but where do they go? Like, what is their end goal? You know, it's just such an interesting company to think about. Um, well, I think you'd have to ask him, but I've, I've read uh, articles with him where he sort of is cop to the fact that at some point Amazon won't be this mammoth thing. Something's going to come replace it. And he says in his, that's true, which is kind of interesting. Like he sort of gets, it can't go on forever and ever and ever. Um, the other thought that comes to mind is that uh, we in America tend to think very much about America, but you know, Amazon's got the whole globe and the, the world loves them. And even if tomorrow, let's say you could shut them down legislatively in the United States, that company would still do fine, you know? Yeah. It'd, it'd be in Canada, Brazil, France. I, you know, you could just see if, I don't know, if, can you get Amazon in China? I don't know. From what I understand with China is it's so regulated that anything that is done for China has to be China specific. So I think the equivalent of Amazon in China is Alibaba. Uh-huh. So that's their Amazon. So um, that's my understanding of how things operate. Like TikTok is fascinating. Do you know what's going on with- I don't, TikTok? tell me. Um, so TikTok is basically this app. I don't actually have one. Uh, I'm not on social media. I have a Facebook, but I don't really use it very much. Um, just my own personal reasons is like, I'm very um, OCD. So like if I got into social media, I would be like, oh my God, I gotta get this number of likes. And I feel it could be very detrimental to my mental health. And when all my friends were getting Instagram and Twitter, I, I just saw a lot of bad things that could happen for me personally. So I've always stayed away from that. But there's this new big platform called TikTok. And a lot of people are getting very quickly famous off TikTok. And there are these very short little clips um, of people making videos. Um, I think it's five to 10 seconds, something around that. So just consuming content really quickly. And it's like, um, if you've ever had Instagram on your phone, you scroll down your phone and there's uh, the way TikTok works is it's actually a Chinese company and um, they use machine learning. So as you slide down your screen and you see a video and you slow down on certain videos, the machine learning algorithm realizes you're slowing down on these types of videos and speeding up and scrolling past other types of videos. So it starts populating your feed with more of the videos that you slowed down on. So now as a consumer, you're like, oh, this is everything. Every time I go into my feed, I'm seeing things that I'm really interested by. So even though Google and um, YouTube use machine learning, uh, TikTok is using machine learning in a different way. That is their user base has grown. I can't say the numbers right now because I don't know. I don't know them off the top of my head, but it's exploded. And actually, because TikTok is from China, everything that happens on TikTok on your phone um, has access to everything else on your phone. And you know, uh, when 
you work in China as a Chinese company, you have to give the government everything you have. So if the government comes and says, we want to know what's going on in your company, they can basically audit you and get your information. So it's kind of like Chinese spyware. And I believe India actually banned TikTok a couple of weeks ago. Amazon sent out um, an email to all their employees yesterday saying that if you have TikTok on your phone, you need to remove TikTok immediately because you can't have your personal stuff on your work phone. And then they retracted that email. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, I'm actually really surprised that Amazon would allow you to have personal stuff on your work phone because it's basically having TikTok on your phone is having Chinese spyware on your phone. So they can access anything that's going on. So it's very interesting to see if the US is going to start banning TikTok. And I don't know what's going on specifically within the US, but it's very, uh, they're getting all your data. So, it, and data is gold. Today, data in 2020 is today's gold. Um, so it's very scary to see what's going to happen with TikTok. But TikTok is so popular. And um, do you know what Quibi is by any chance? No. Quibi is like this new platform that came out, I believe, six weeks ago, roughly like that. And they were giving out basically free trials for like a month or something. And now that the free trials have ended for a lot of people, 92% of people stopped using Quibi. So they only retained 8% of people now willing to pay for that platform. But it had a bunch of major celebrities like Liam Hemsworth, a bunch of huge named celebrities. I think Zac Efron was on it. And it's basically like 10 minute episodes. So you're at the grocery store and you're waiting in line and you can go and it's like Netflix, but a 10 minute version on your phone where you can watch episodes and stuff. And it's longer form than uh, TikTok, but shorter form than Netflix. So I think what these companies are trying to do is with my generation, a lot of people's attention spans are really quick. They just want to consume, consume, consume what's new, what's new. They don't want to sit to, through like the Irishman, like a three and a half hour long movie, you know? So it's really interesting to see um, how big TikTok became and then how Quibi, basically no one wants to pay for Quibi because if you think about it, you're paying for, you're paying the same amount kind of as having a Netflix subscription, but with less content on Quibi because it's just a lot of little content, but it's not as much content and you're going to be paying for the same amount. Do you think as like being in the industry and writing, do you see that trend for people wanting to consume smaller amounts of contact content, such as like, it's the golden age of TV. Do you think that that's going to even get shorter? You know how TV shows are like an hour, maybe now 30 minutes is the golden amount of time or sitcoms, like a good 20 minute show. Do you think that that trend is going to continue and get bigger? Well, I think that the what's changed is and just sort of observing my kids and other kids consume. Um, they're fifty percent video. Well, they're maybe fifty percent texting, right? And they're twenty five percent video gaming, and they're twenty five percent watching shows. And what they do is they'll binge, right? So. I don't think it's a t like, so they'll watch literally both of my children have gone through all nine seasons of the office and are now rewatching all nine seasons of the office, <laughs> but what they, they, and then they quote to each other from it. Um, but what they can do is they can start that or stop that anytime they want. They can pick any episode. You don't have to wait a week for it to come back on television. So I think, with the ability to start, stop, download it physically to your, your, your device or not. I don't know that the forms are going to change until we get into a reality where we're interacting as audience. Um, I think that's going to kind of stay, but I think um, these, and they already are, you're just going to have these shows releasing their entire seasons at one, at one time rather than once a week. I think that's going to change, but long as you've got these devices and you can um, you can hit um, start stop whenever you want, you can access it wherever you want. I think that's the control, and I don't know that a, a story that's ten, ten minutes is. I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, a good story is a good story, and the, the answer ultimately I think comes down to 
any length. It's not the length. It, it's how how good is how how hooked are you as a viewer as to what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. So if I can make you really care about what's going to happen next, you will watch the Iron Irishman, which kind of makes you really care. But uh, um, you know, but if it's a nail biter of a so a really interesting series would be like uh, which lasted for two seasons. Uh, it was called Counterpart. And the genius of that show is their ability to make you really want to know what's going to happen next. And just brilliantly doing that over and over and over and over and over again. So I think whether it's five seconds or five hours, the name of the game is to be hook and hold, hook and hold. And that's going to make storytellers be tighter um and keep the level of suspense up uh quickly and um keep asking questions that you're dying to know the answer to which story always is sort of done anyway so i think that rate might increase a bit and i think the thing that we're sort of really not talking not talking about because remember the office was a, a british sitcom first um i think what makes the office the office is not the show as well done as it is and it's it's well written and uh clever format but what what makes it the office and what makes it this thing that my kids are now going to rewatch a second time is the likability and the desire to want to spend time with those actors as those characters mm. it's it's right it's replacing uh my children have a relationship with those characters in the office, right? It's like why half the people watch television news. It's it's not to watch the news. It's to have a relationship with that anchor person that substitutes for human encounter. And so, you know, Steve Carell is a really cool guy to hang out with. Obviously, you would you're smiling because right, you'd hang out with him. Yeah, he seems like you, a cool guy. You'd have him over for a couple hours. You wouldn't be bored. And so, yeah. So I think it's it's the the. And it's a, you can't be trained. People are just born with a, a certain personality that people want to spend time with. And I think that's sort of going to continue. So there's going to be, in a way, a star system. And that that's going to continue to be a part of the coin of the realm in entertainment. And, you know, maybe there's, you know, it's like five seconds. You know, that format's perfect. When Twitter got invented, right, everyone said, and it was true. They said, well, this format's perfect for Steve Martin, right? Mm -hmm. And it was, he's hilarious on Twitter because he's very quick. And so yeah, I could see Steve Martin doing a TV show where the episodes are 10 minutes and you'd watch that show, but it'd be because of Steve Martin, it wouldn't be in his talent. It wouldn't be because, and you like hanging out with him. It wouldn't be because it was 10 minutes. Mm, that's very interesting. That's a very interesting perspective. Do you think because of coronavirus, your writing has changed? Like. Uh, no, um, the the temptation in a lot of writers I talk to is to change their their content to take it into consideration. Um, interestingly, nothing really changes in history. Shakespeare wrote many of his plays uh, under uh, uh, quarantine during the plagues, and um, though. Uh, of his 37 plays, there is only one reference to a plague and it's very brief. So I think he got, they would, or I don't know, but he, he didn't write about them. Um, and yet that's when he got a lot of his writing done. So um, in terms of writing, no, I think you just write the stories you wanna write and then there's an audience for them or a market or not and you continue to get better practicing your craft and to try to write to market and entertainment's a fool's errand. So for instance, if when Star Wars was really hot, right? If you were gonna, no one would buy sci-fi by the way, you know, no one wanted to make Star Wars because the a, a wisdom which was widely accepted was that you could not make money with a sci-fi film. Think about that. You could, studios knew you could not make money. And in fact, Universal passed on Star Wars. Hmm. And the, the story coverage, so people get paid to read scripts and they write these reports and they recommend or not, 
and they get a recommend or a pass. And it, the, there's a story report of Star Wars framed in the story department in Universal with the pass and the analyst saying, no one watches science fiction. I don't get this. No one's going to, you know, this is just like, this is a waste of like, don't, you know, we should be passing on this, right? One of the all time money making film franchises ever, maybe the really, and they passed on it. And then an executive Fox read it and he had just seen American Graffiti and um, he met with George Lucas and he said straight up, I don't understand your screenplay. This Star Wars thing, I don't, I don't really get it. But, but I loved American Graffiti. So if you can make Star Wars for less than $10 million, I'll, I'll cut the check. Yeah. And he did and the rest is history, right? So there's three to, every three to five years, there'll be a sort of wave of a kind of films or a kind of TV programs that are popular and that'll change. And so if you try to write to that market, by the time your stuff is at that level and done, the market's moved on. Mm -hmm. So I think that the trick there is to just follow, or to write what interests you because you're likely gonna write that well. Um, and, uh, is sort of the long and the short answer because to try to predict public taste isn't an impossible. My, my favorite story about that is uh, Groucho Marx from the Marx Brothers, sort of big vaudeville movie comedian stars in the 30s, kind of the biggest really. And um, Groucho, he had been working since he'd been four or five years old in vaudeville and been very successful ultimately with his brothers and made a lot of money. And when the stock market crashed in 1929, he had 100% of his assets in the stock market. And it was a million dollars. He was worth a million dollars in 1929. And he lost all of it, which was like his worst nightmare. It was a lot of people's worst nightmare, right? But Groucho who had you know, done eight shows a day, six days a week, traveling the country, doing vaudeville year after year after year. You know, he was, he'd really worked for his, 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 his money and he was sort of very distraught. And then he didn't really make it back until television. And he had a game show called What's My Line, I think was the name of the game show. And um, he started really making his fortune back again. And he did that. People did not understand why Groucho Marx was doing TV for decades. And the answer was he was making his money back. So, the, but the punchline of the story is he got audited by the IRS one year, right? And like, this is a time when the IRS would like literally come to your house and talk to you. So there's an IRS agent with Groucho Marx and his lawyer and his accountant sitting in the living room. And, um, and th they start just getting drilling down into the, the discrepancies and Groucho's like arguing every little point. And the guy's like, you're, you're like, you're Groucho Marx, you're famous, you're worth all this money. I don't understand. You seem so anxious, so concerned that you're going to somehow lose it all. And Groucho Marx says, you don't understand. I make my living is dependent on a fickle public. And he really understood that that was true, that that audience could stay or they could go away tomorrow and never come back. Hmm. And so, um, so I think it's like, uh, if one's interested, if, 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 you, if you're Amazon, I think, they, they, yeah, and it's what they do so well, right? They diversify. Yeah. They try lots of different things. They see what's working now. They see what doesn't work anymore. They see what's going to work next. And the, the public's going to, you know, they're going to vote with their, with their pocketbook pretty fast. And in this day and age, they're going to, you know, really fast. Yeah. And so what you're talking about is data being gold. Exactly right. Though I have to feel like in the future, uh, I have to presuppose um, anything that's sitting on my computer is compromised. Uh, I just, smart. yeah, you know, I just think that's a smart presupposition. You, you, you don't want to be putting, you know, you're, you don't want to be putting the secret recipe to Kentucky Fried Chicken on your laptop because someone's going to get on and, and find it. I think you just got to, you got to realize you're in a public space. There's nothing private about your email at all. It, yeah. it, and so um, I think once people start realizing that, maybe it, it just, you know, like just think about the NSA for a second, right? Their, their job is to be 10 years ahead of everyone with computer technology. And by all accounts, they always have been. Like I just have to presuppose, in a, like I would be very disappointed if they couldn't get on any machine in the world.
Mm -hmm. And yeah. they, they worked their way onto machines that were not networked, right? They, they figured out how to do that by going to the companies that make the software and having them install backdoors. Mm -hmm. So, because all these, so you know what I mean, there, there's no, these, these are computers that have never been on the internet. So yeah. in theory, they're not compromisable. Yeah. Right. Um, and they figured out a way around that. You yeah. know, that, the nuclear program in Iran, I, I think the Israelis did that, right? They, they, the way they hacked on to these computers that weren't on the network was um, routine maintenance updates with, for programs that, from, you know, commercial companies. So you've got to figure all of this stuff is going to become public for better or worse um, sooner than later. And so therefore how that changes business modeling and, you know, that I don't, I don't know, but I think the, like the cybersecurity is kind of an oxymoron. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting thing I just read about What's is that? one of the earliest investors of Google was the CIA. So the CIA and Google are so intertwined and actually Google hires so many ex um, NSA people that they have their own branch from what I, I have read in Google with all ex NSA employees. So if there's anyone that could be seeing all of our Gmail, it's Google. Anyone that could be seeing anything we're searching, it's Google and the CIA and Google are so intertwined. So I think that's how they always have a leg up. And I'm not sure overseas if Google is the biggest search engine. I know in the United States it is, but I don't know overseas, but they definitely in the US know, this is conspiracy, but I think Google knows everything. CIA is like, okay, well, we invested in Google. We have a bunch of ex CIA people and NSA people working at Google. We're going to know what's going on. And I always wondered what, like everything we have on our Gmail, like, so you can store a bunch of documents on your computer, but then you're eventually going to run out of storage. Well, you have an infinite amount of documents you could store on your Gmail. You could just keep uh, emailing yourself all these documents and storing it on Google servers. So Google could honestly see anything you have. So what is Google really getting out of giving Gmail for free? I don't know. I suspect they're getting our data. So if they ever wanted to look through our data, well, we'll provide this service for free, this really great service, this really easy to use service. And then what do you, what does Google get out of the relationship? Because I think everything is a, give take relationship google's getting all your data so you're not paying for it and you're not paying for storing your data on gmail but google's getting all that data and if they wanted to go in and look and i'm not saying they do but who knows they could go in and see anything you're storing yeah i think you just have to presuppose that's all true um, my, my favorite clip there's a wonderful movie called citizen four that was the uh did, uh, did you see citizen four no, what is that? So it's a filmmaker and a reporter, and they're in the hotel room with Ed, Edward Snowden, mm -hmm. as he's literally divulging all this stuff to them. And they're literally, he's waiting for the NSA to come barreling down into the hotel door. And they're in Hong Kong because the international laws make it less likely, more likely he might not go to jail, right? So. They're in the hotel, and this is like in live time that they're filming him doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the reporter's writing the articles that they're going to print, and he's, he's dumping all the information. And he's got them all on, um, he's got them all on clean, brand new uh, laptops out of the box where he's making them take stuff out and putting other things in before they even power them on. But he, he himself with his, he, so it's a hotel room, right? There's no windows. He himself will not enter any password information without putting a blanket over his head. So he's thinking or knowing there's camera technology that would allow you in a closed room to still get a visual picture of his, your computer screen. He called it like the shroud of secrecy. It was very funny because it's like they're in a Hilton, right? And he's putting like the bedspread over his head 
and typing onto his machine. And then he's like taking it back off again. So I think at some point we have to, it's not, it's not just gonna be Google. I just think this information is gonna be available to everyone. Therefore, I guess the lesson is don't have anything to hide because you're not gonna be able to hide it anymore. You're just yeah. not. Are you going to have to be really smart and have your own servers and store everything? But that's a whole nother thing. You said in movies um, and writing, there's always like, I don't know what number you said, like five year time period where everyone's writing about sci-fi or um, right now, maybe um, superheroes. What do you have any like indication um, from the writers you work with, like what might be the next big thing? No one knows. No one knows. No one it never just, knows. When it happens, if, it if, happens. If you, if you knew that, you, you could, you could, you could be, you could be the next Amazon. Yeah, no one knows. It's just a, a film comes out or a TV show comes out, um, you know, and the entire landscape changes. Um, uh, again, it goes back to that Groucho Marx quote about the taste of a fickle public. Um, no one knows in advance what the next big thing will be. I mean, people said forever Westerns were dead, right? And then Westerns came back and, you know, now you're right, it's superheroes and it seems like they're going to be forever. But at some point, audiences are going to get tired of superhero movies. I hate to break it to superhero movie fans, but they will. Um, and they're very expensive to make. And uh, as you can count on Hollywood to cash in as long as it can. And they should, they're in business, it's show business. But no one knows what's going to be next. And uh, it's, there's some kid in film school right now or in high school making little films in their backyard that has an idea for some story and they're going to make it 10 years from now and it's going to end up uh, somehow in the world and it's going to change and we're not going to see superhero movies. It's going to be whatever that next thing is. Mm -hmm. um, and unless my theory is, is possibly right about you're going to be in movies. And I think you're going to be in TV shows, by the way. You're going to be in sitcoms. You're going to be in every episode of The Office as a character. And you're going to get to talk to all those characters and move through The Office with your controls, either virtually or on your, your game station. And you're going to be able to go into you know, uh, um, Steve Carell's office and have a conversation with him about a problem and it's going to have multiple punchlines based on what you're saying to him and it's going to seem completely like you're just having a conversation again you're going to be the hero of a character in the office or you you could be a character on south park oh that's the other thing i wanted to mention because you bring up a very interesting point i think because of corona what you're going to see in the next one to two years is a flood of animated television shows mm -hmm. yeah. particularly comedies because it's a no-brainer, right? They can make them remotely. No one has to be in the same room. Um, like the Family Guy, shows like that have done South Park. The Simpsons has been on for eons. So I think you're gonna see more of that for a while. And people are gonna just be excited for the fresh content. You're gonna recognize the star's voices. You're gonna get to like the characters the way people do. Um, so that I think you could see start to happening. And I know television executives right now that are literally developing animated adult uh, cart or cartoons, half hour comedies. And that, that's literally actively happening now. And those shows are gonna start to get made very soon because you have all these people that are out of work. Yeah. Yeah. And you could send the equipment to their house and, and, you know, they've got the budgets and they can hire their writers and they can all work virtually and you can edit it all online and, and then animate it. Obviously, you just need a person in the computer. So that's coming. Mm -hmm. I think that's coming in the next six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. So if you like animated comedies for adults, if The Simpsons is your thing and Family Guy, you're in luck. Yeah, I, I love, I'm a sucker for animated things like Pixar movies I love that's a little child in me and then also I have a weird affinity for rom-coms I don't know why I was actually last night I started watching I've never seen this before and everyone raves about this movie Sleepless in Seattle yes of course this came on Netflix and I watched the beginning of it and then fell asleep uh right when she was, I believe it was Meg Ryan right she was the one the main character and she just heard of um Tom Hanks character on the radio um, and I watched that for the beginning of that and I, I'm just a sucker for those two genres. So I'm well, excited. That, 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 so I was just gonna say Sleepless is a groundbreaking movie, right? Because um, 
the, the, the formula for romantic comedies is this boy and girl meet, they break apart, they get back together again. So this, the the, the storyline in Seapless in Seattle is boy meets girl, and then the movie's over. The entire two hours is about them physically meeting, yeah. which is v very cl clever. But people love rom-coms because they have a happy ending. Yeah, they do. You got to have a happy ending. Yeah. And, and they've got romance and they've got humor and everyone can relate to trying to be in a relationship and not going horribly wrong, which would be most of our movie. And that's funny because we laugh at what is true is what we recognize as being true in our own lives. And then the ending, all's well that ends well. I, I, I'm trying to think of a rom-com where they don't really end up together. It's, is that even possible? I don't, I can't think of anything. But do you think rom-coms are bad for people that think this is how it happens? Like they make it like, what is it called? A meat cute? They always have a meat cute. Do you think it sets a bad precedence for people where well, they expect a meat cute to happen or they want their life to kind of follow this storybook fairy tale kind of movie? So it's been argued that the person that really created that problem was Walt Disney um, with the princesses and the animated movies. Um, and you could say that what Walt Disney did was he was just taking brilliantly myth and fairy tale and then the dark side of that, which would be the uh, Brothers Grimm. Um, and that stuff has been around for a long time. The whole idea of a wicked stepmother and uh, the, the put upon stepchild that's forced to work and can't go to the ball. And then she meets her. Think of Hansel and Gretel. Mm -hmm. Or um, not Hansel and Gretel, I'm sorry. What's the one with the girl in the tower? Rapunzel. Rapunzel. Rapunzel's been around a while. Yeah. What is Rapunzel doing? She's up in a tower. She's trapped. She's waiting for the man of her dreams. And he's right. Yeah. And in, in, in the original Rapunzel, which was much more grim, by the way, the way the Wicked Witch found out that Rapunzel had been letting down her hair is that the original Rapunzel gets pregnant. Really? I did not yep. know. That's, that's the original Rapunzel. Um, so, you know, obviously the prince was making it up into the tower. But those stories have been around for a long time. And if you think about books like, you think of, say, one of the most popular fiction writers ever, Charles Dickens. Yeah. Well, what's he writing about? He's writing about very impoverished people who somehow, through luck, determination, being, having good character, after they go through and we see the effects of poverty, uh, they end up, like great expectations, they end up becoming uh, very uh, wealthy. Dickens' stuff originally was published, speaking of how people got their content, you know, his books weren't published as books. They were published in weekly newspapers, and you got a chapter. And so you'd have to wait a week for the next chapter. Uh, what's going to happen to Pip next week? Oh, what's going to happen to Pip next week? Yeah. People don't realize that, that it was a form of TV, really. Yeah. It was. It was serialized storytelling. So every chapter had to be really good something really exciting had to happen and it had to leave you wondering what would happen next. And this is, you know, when there's a printing press and that's it. Right. Um, and then he ultimately makes his money because there's no copyright, right? So he doesn't make a lot of money off of his books, Dickens. He makes his money um, touring the world, particularly England and the United States, going into these 1500 seat, 2000 seat theaters reading from his work and people were just like rock star. He was a rock star of his day. And people would pay for these very expensive tickets to hear Dickens read from his own work. Mm. And that's, that was how he monetized it. But uh, that sort of precedent for that mythology of the fairy tale has been with us for hundreds of years or longer. And then Walt Disney really figured out how to turn that into an empire, right? Yeah. And he, he claims his one mistake that he regrets. And he was a man who did not regret. He, he, his brother was the financial genius and Disney was the create. Walt was a creative and Roy was the, uh, the finance guy. And Walt, Walt Disney expressed his only mistake that he ever made. And they, they, three, three times they were gonna completely go under and they put every penny of their own money they had to save that studio. 
which is just, you know, that's belief. But um, he said the only mistake he ever made was killing Bambi's mother. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, all those, all those Disney movies, their, their entire PhDs are written on how that in women in particular and in general sets up romantic expectations that can, cannot, cannot be fulfilled in, in, in real life. Yeah. So I think that's the kind of more uh, genesis of that, of Disney really getting a hold of that formula and realizing he, he can make great movies and people would see them and love them and then go to his theme park to want to meet those characters. Um, so, you know, I think it's that. But you make a great point. I mean, I don't know. I'm, ha I'm happily married, knock on wood, for 18 years. You're, you're a single young fellow. Do you, do you think you're going to you're gonna meet someone under funny circumstances. You're, you're gonna not get along, get along for a little while. You're gonna go on some wacky adventure. Then ultimately you're gonna have mistaken identity. Then you're gonna figure out it was just a mistake and then you're gonna get married and live happily ever after and the credits are gonna roll and you're gonna never ever have a disagreement with your partner the rest of your life. No, I don't think that, but it's a weird time to be a young person dating with coronavirus and just in general with social media, the perspective I have on the situation is I feel like a lot of people meet each other through Instagram um, or through online dating apps like Tinder or Hinge or Bumble, things of that nature. Um, and it seems like it's more of a superficial meeting and this is, purely my perspective. You see someone, you like their photos, and that's how you get to first interact with them. And then you talk to them over chat, um, whether that be iMessaging or whatever. And it's very weird because even right now, we're having a great conversation, but I don't like this whole, we're not face to face, you know? It's just a weird way to communicate. And then when you're trying to meet somebody romantically for the first time, between photos that could be altered and this couldn't even be what you look like, or this could be you at your very best moment and that's what I'm seeing. And then you might be really good at texting. Um, you know, there's other subtleties that you have to understand. Like texting is a language in itself. Writing emojis is a language in itself. I actually heard, um, I'm gonna go on a little random tangent here, but in law school, they're starting to teach what like deciphering emojis because I think there was a case where um, two people were planning to um, do a murder and they were sending emojis back to each other. So in court, how do you prove that they were planning to do this, this court case because we've never studied like emojis in this language of emojis. So going back to like dating, I think that's something that like, I'm not on social media. I have Facebook, don't ever really use it. I'm not a big texter, like I'll call people. And I feel like my generation finds that very foreign. They always want to just be texted. And I think it's the weirdest form to, um, to text back and forth. And I get it, but I think you get so much more from a real conversation with someone. So this whole fairy tale, meeting somebody and running off and it, I can't see myself, you know, that, that sounds really romantic in my head. And I wish something like that would happen but I just can't see myself. And I feel like the older you get, the more you're isolated in your own bubble. So you're only in your bubble and you're only really seeing the people you work with. And you're not in like college where you're seeing a bunch of random people all the time. And if you don't like to go out and drink and you're not going to the bars, it's really hard to meet people, you know? So, and the older you get, I think your circle becomes smaller and smaller unless you develop that skill and become really, extroverted and utilize social media. Um, but with coronavirus, the game is completely flipped on its head right now because you can't even go out and meet people, you know? And now you're all segregated to just being on your phone and meeting people through dating apps. And I'm on dating apps, but I'm a little bit nervous because right now I live at home and I can't afford to get my mother sick because of my stupid decision going out and meeting somebody and maybe me contracting. I'm not worried about me contracting coronavirus, but maybe I get it from someone else and I'm asymptomatic and I give it to someone I care about, you know? So 
it's very weird. I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of different girls on these dating apps, but they kind of fizzle out because I'm just not the best texter. And that's maybe a skill I have to develop. I don't know. We'll see how this game plays out and we'll see what happens once we're out of lockdown and bars are open and we can go and socialize. Um, but I do think girls have this preconceived notion that something magical should happen, especially over text. Like if you're not, like I've talked to some of my friends who are girls and they're looking for guys to say the most craziest things, like the opening scene of Gone Girl, where Ben Affleck's character and Rosema Pike, I'm forgetting her name, they have just great dialogue back and forth. Like they're looking for that over text. And it's just like, it's really hard to like do. And then I have girls that text me and say, how's your day? And then I text that to girls. And my girlfriends are like, you shouldn't text that. You should come up with something clever. Like don't say how your day. But then the girls come and text me and ask me how my day is. So it's just really weird. It's something that I'm trying to learn. Um, but we'll see where that whole thing goes. Uh, so do you guys not move over from a texting to FaceTime? To some sort of FaceTime? I try to, but a lot of people don't want to do it. And I don't know if that's the people that I'm attracting into my life because my profile is pretty, like I had a tough time because you have to choose like five photos or something. And I'm not one of those guys that takes a lot of photos. And I'm noticing a lot more guys take a lot of photos. Like when I go to the gym, a lot of guys are taking photos. And growing up, that was the weirdest thing to me. Like my friends were always like, that's just weird. You don't do that. You're trying to be a try hard. So that just kind of ingrained to me that I just don't take a lot of photos of myself. So I really struggled with finding five like decent photos. So I don't know if my profile's weak and they don't want to like FaceTime with me, but I always kind of ease in and I'm like, Hey, do you want to like have a phone call or FaceTime? And then the conversation just kind of fizzles out. Um, really? so I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or it's the girls. I don't know. It's kind of really weird and abstract. Because what I've been having a lot of is, um, which I'm totally allowed to do with friends, is we have, um, we either have a lunch together. Mm -hmm. uh, like I have several friends I have lunch once a week uh, virtually, or there's uh, a, another friend and um, she's working during the day. And so she and I do happy hour every other week, yeah. at five o'clock. How is um, it? And then I have a, another friend who he's divorced for a couple of years and he um, was sort of having a hard time in general, just cause that's hard. Right. And he's just starting to date again. And um, he uh, met someone and well, that's the thing that's becoming really interesting. Right. They, if, if you're going to go to, there've been some articles in the times about people having dates, like have a move, they'll watch the same movie while they're online together yeah they'll yeah. pop the dvd in at the same time or whatever um but what becomes interesting about that is geography then becomes irrelevant right so this guy met someone in the uh, florida keys which is the southmost part of of you know the united states and um they were they, they got to the point where they were on facetime two three hours every night wow and she, she's like, after like four months of this, because they were getting to have, know each other very intensely. She was just like, you know, I got to, I got to figure out what this is, what we have here. And she got an airplane from Key West to, and she's staying with him for two weeks. Wow. Okay. And that's all from, and that's like, so then you're dating, pulling away, you talk about a bubble, but then now all of a sudden you could have a girlfriend in Paris. Yeah. How long were they like talking before she got on a plane? Four months, something like that. But it got apparently very intense and very like up late at night, every night. Yeah. They just were so simpatico. They never would want to stop talking. There was yeah. just, uh, you, you know, I don't think that, but um, there was, there've been a couple of articles in the New York times about people trying to date in the way I described just sort of, by FaceTime, and then they'll go on socially distant dates where they're six feet apart, and then the real question becomes the big commitment is are they gonna break that six feet or not? <laughs> that becomes the big, you know. So I think that's gonna be true for a while, but it, at some point it, it, it's not gonna be, and, um, and, and in a way maybe it's good, maybe in a way, um, maybe in a way people on the back end of this 
I would think might, I mean, you're thoughtful about this, but I think people might be more thoughtful about their choices of who they're with and might be a little less disposable or taken for granted. Yeah. Because yeah, I agree. When you meet someone that's special and like things are good, but then there's, oh, this other person over here, they seem kind of cool, but maybe you'll more realize, oh, no, wait a minute. It's hard to find someone that's really special and you don't really know if that other person's cool or not. And so maybe in a way it'll make people a little bit more practical. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it'll all, look, what happens? World War II happens. All the men that are able-bodied get shipped to fight overseas. The women take over all the jobs in the factories. It changes our country forever. The men come back. We have this incredible baby boom. It all sort of, the best start that we've ever had in, in, in the last hundred years all comes sort of right after World War II. Yeah. So there'll be a lot of really positive unintended consequences, but I can't imagine a single woman I know for a fact, single woman had a horrible time in uh, the United States during the, the Second World War. There were, there were no single men here. Yeah. Or married men for that matter. There just weren't any men. That you know, there were elderly men, there were kids, and yeah. then there were guys that um were deferred out, which you know, they'd won the jackpot pretty much. And you know, everyone else was in 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 um in in Asia or uh or Europe. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, so the poor the poor British, the quote about the British men were because all these Americans who were much more aggressive with women than they were, they said we have a problem. All the American men are, they're 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 all over here, <laughs> and we can't because they were all waiting to stage right for D-Day. And so apparently, if you were a British guy, you just had real problems. And the British women apparently there were a lot of marriages that came out of that, and a lot of kids. And really, mm -hmm. what do you think of right now with this? Black Lives Matter, this huge movement right now that's going on in terms of the entertainment industry. Um, do you think that there's going to be more ambiguous casting for um, actors? Like, do you think, because my perspective on the whole situation as an actor um, in the area is I don't get a lot of opportunity to audition for a lot of things because I'm not white and this is my perspective but it seems like from the area i'm from where i'm auditioning it seems like 70 percent of the roles are white 25 percent of the roles are either african american or african american and then five percent tend to be wild cards which i think i fit into that category of mm -hmm. being spanish or asian so i honestly get a lot of auditions for like 40 year olds that are more ambiguous, but do you think with what's going on right now um, that that's going to change the industry? So I, I, you know, I just tell you what I really think. And again, to quote William Goldman about show business, no one knows anything. Um, I, you know what, I don't, I don't think it will change things in the sense that, you know, in 1968, uh, there were mass, uh, uh, in fact, part of Washington, D.C. burned down after the assassination of Dr. King. And um, uh, so you want to talk about protest. And my great aunt and uncle can literally remember National Guard tanks driving up, you know, northwest Washington to, to, to quiet down the unrest. So I think over time, incrementally, slowly, it does change. Um, the, the, there's the, I want to say the woman who, and I could be wrong, but the woman who played the, um, there's no other way to see, was a servant. She was a housekeeper in Gone with the Wind, was nominated for an Academy Award and I, as supporting, and I think might have even won, but wasn't physically allowed into the movie theater to collect her Oscar. Wow. And think about the roles, Hattie something, think about the roles that would have been available to her as an actress in 1940s Hollywood. And then I'm trying to think of who the actress that won and was able to collect it on stage was. And it was kind of like, 
it was this thing where it was that were they going to let her in the uh, auditorium or not because it was still segregation and ultimately she forced her way in at the last second they weren't going to let her in they said they would they planned not to they let her in um and then you have a a, a performer like a sydney poitier come along right and really change what audiences and who they're interested in watching and um because ultimately Hollywood is gonna do, despite what anybody thinks, they're, they're gonna do what they, they perceive and or they know to be true. That you can say that Hollywood does a lot of things very badly, but I would purport to you that the one thing they do very well is monetize their product to the maximum. And so, I, you know, I think what you're talking about is a societal change is gonna be the shift. I don't. It's the chicken and egg, but I don't think it's if you all of a sudden put different people on shows that, that would be it. It would be more like people would, there's going to be some star that comes along, like a Sidney Poitier, right? Someone who, from Indian descent who's just very charismatic and has that sort of, again, people just want to spend time with him or her, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're going to become huge, just huge, kind of like a way Tom Cruise, uh, you know, after Risky Business is going to be that kind of a thing, or the Tom Hanks after a big, or, or you know, a, a, a Meg Ryan after Sleepless in Seattle. And all of a sudden that person's going to become huge and they're going to open the door for many more to follow. And, and I think that that's the more likely route that that would happen. The other interesting thing for me, of course, of course and, and you might not, um, can can we pause for like one minute? I apologize. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. I'll be right back. My wife is screaming. Oh, it's all good. Yeah, go do your thing. I can somehow, but I have to oh. It's crazy though, the entertainment industry and what's going on. Hopefully. Hopefully. So, so now, Jay, you can tell everyone to do your podcast because apparently it gets you out of having to unload the car for with groceries with your <laughs> wife. She's like, oh, if you're doing that, you can go back. Go back to Jay. Talk to him. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, you know, the other, the other, the, 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 the two things I think are one. Well, the one thing I really think about when you bring this up, and we may have talked about this before, would be John Oguizamo, uh, Hispanic, uh, Anna Devere Smith, African American woman, six feet two, um, and Eric Bogosian. And if Eric is watching this, I, I know Eric. Hi, Eric is one of the most <laughs> unattractive human beings you'll see in your life. He's just not a handsome guy. He's very talented and funny, and but you wouldn't say classically good looking. In fact, when they made a movie of his play, they fought for years because the studio didn't want to let him do it. They didn't want him to star in his own movie. And then he got start, started working as an actor as creepy bad guys eventually became his niche, which was not his intent. But he was like living in a church in New York and unemployable. He literally lived in a church floor. Like a priest said, you can come live here. Wow. while you're trying to be an actor. And then Luciano get, got get, getting cast as drug dealers on Miami Vice and stuff. And that's all he could get. And uh, Ended Vera Smith just couldn't get gas, period. Because wow. she was African-American and she was 6'2". So she just was not. So what did the three of them do? They all created one-person shows that became massively successful. And they, you know, Ended Vera Smith ends up on uh, uh, and she's doing socially conscious one woman shows. She did the, the show on uh, Rodney King, Distant Fires, right? Where she plays 30 characters, including the mayor of Los Angeles. It's brilliant. But then she gets on West Wing, which was her goal all along. Uh, uh, Luguziama does movies all the time. Uh, Bogosian um, uh, gets to play bad guys um when he's not writing any and but all these and then there's dale orlando smith who's an african-american woman who is just let's say extra large size she just she's a big woman um and she she i believe she was nominated and i think she won a pulitzer and she has not gotten on tv or film but she does these one woman shows and makes a really good living so the, the, Melton Burley used to say, if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. 
and not that everyone has it. Whoopi Goldberg, there's a great example. Yeah. Look at Whoopi. She was uh, working to support her child. She was a makeup artist for dead people. She worked at, at a mortuary in Harlem. That That's was her day job. Yeah. That was a crazy to, job. To support her daughter. She had yeah. to support, she had a kid to support. She had, she had to do, yeah. And she said, no one's going to cast, look at me. Who's going to cast me? <laughs> and so she did the one woman show. It was a hit. Spielberg found out about it. Asked her if he could see it. Flew her. He, she said, of course, she couldn't believe. She hung up on him. She didn't believe it was him calling. Second time, she really, she's like, oh, it really is Steven Spielberg. Oh, Mr. Spielberg, of course, how many tickets do you want? One night, he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I want to fly you to my living room. I want you to do the show for my friends. He did, she did. And he was in the middle of pre-production on The Color Purple. Yeah, wow. So she built a door. That is insane. You know, she built a door. And, um, you, you know, so, and Asif Mandavi, who uh, we, um, we may have talked about, I don't know. But mm -hmm. Asif, uh, I worked on uh, associate producing his one-man show, Sakina's Restaurant. Now that led to him getting reviewed in the New York Times. It sold out. Um, Merchant Ivory loved it and moved it to London, sold out. Then they hired him to rewrite movies for a year or two. Then from that, he had a big pile of money in the bank. He moved back. He had been living in his parents' basement in New Jersey. And needless to say, they were not thrilled that Asif was not in medical school. They were not happy with his career decisions, literally. And, um, uh, and then he, 9-11 um, happened. And um, the, the Daily Show was looking for actors that could play in comedy sketches. It sounds absurd and sad, but it was true. They were looking for an actor who could play terrorist, a terrorist. Mm -hmm. And Asif jumped on that. And then based on all that, he, he started being able to make his own. He made like two feature films that he starred in. Mm -hmm. um, and then he had like a TV show of his own on Comedy Central. But if he hadn't spent five years in his parents' basement developing Sakina's restaurant, and then had the sort of, because um, it took him five years to develop the show, but also to get it produced in, in New York and for the New York Times to come. Yeah. And he's, he's got a career, you know, he's got an agent, he does commercials, he does, he's got a mainstream Hollywood career. But he knew if he didn't, if he didn't, and I'm not saying that's true for anyone. I'm not saying the system can't work. You can't walk through the door and get cast as something and you're the best for the part. Um, the way I was trained is you, you, it's colorblind casting. You just cast the best actor and the audience is going to forget after about five minutes, but who cares what color they are? Can they act? Do I care about the character? Are they interesting? Are they compelling? Um, for me, that's, you know, the, 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 because you, you could put someone who's perfectly whoever you want them to look like Reese Witherspoon, but if they can't act, then so, um, but having said that, I think that, 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 that um, Asa fully understood, as did John Luguziamo, fully understood Anna Devere Smith. They all knew, it, because their goal is to be famous, right? That's a whole different goal from being a working actor. Um, but they're, they said, this is the only way it's going to happen, if it ever happens. And so that's what they set about to do. And that's how they did it. And I'm sure for every one of them, I know, because I know the guy that taught them all, had many students that studied with them and it didn't become who they became. So there's talent, hard work. And then it all circles back to, does an audience want to spend time with you? You know, people love, if you go see, I worked on a John Luguziama show, Freak. It ran on Broadway, sold out audiences. He makes so much more in films, he can't really afford to do them for more than a half year, which sounds kind of ludicrous, right? Yeah. But the money is so much less on Broadway than it would be to do, you know, six weeks on a movie. Um, but you went in there and audience sources were just energized. They just loved. In fact, I was with him when he was developing it at PS122. So this 90 minute show was three hours long and you could go for free because he was testing out the material. And audiences would sit there for three hours listening to this one guy speak, you know? And some of the material wasn't very good and they still would. Well, why? Because they liked just hanging out with, with John Luguziamo. Yeah. Wow. He had that X factor, why people want to watch him. 
I couldn't tell you. It's just, it's built in. Yeah, that's, that's, what did Sidney Portier do? Was Sidney Portier just such, because he, in my memory, was the first big African-American movie star that I can remember. Was he, I know he was a phenomenal actor, but was it also the time when he came into the industry that was right? Was it a combination of those two? You would, have, you would definitely want to do your homework on that, but my strong guess is going to be, as it often is, it was one role in one movie, and then that was it. Like, so, you know, again, circling back to Tom Cruise, obviously a, a white guy, uh, Risky Business. He'd done movies before that. Yeah. You can see them. He was perfectly good in them. Um, but no one knew who he was. And then he does Risky Business. And, you know, he does that dance on that sofa and that's it. He, he's a movie star for 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just true. That's just it. It's done deal, right? It's baked in. Um, so... And then Top Gun really, for him, sealed that deal. And it was really a done deal. My wife paid $80 with her sister. They each spent $40 so they could co-own a Betamax of seeing Tom Cruise and Top Gun. Wow. <laughs> right? So it's the part and it's the time and it's the... And so I, I would guess it would maybe be Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Um, a film like that would have done that for him. Um, I'm not sure which one was the breakthrough film for him, but my guess would be there would be that one film. And then it's just sort of like Clint Eastwood, right? No one knew who he was. He was a stuntman who wanted to act. No one knew who he was. He, you can see him do, he's horrible. He's in the musical of Oklahoma hmm. and he sings and he sings horribly. I can't even believe a Warner Brothers released him singing and didn't, die. you can watch it. I feel like he feels bad for himself. <laughs> And then he goes to Italy, this crazy Italian guy, Sergio Leone, is making these West, these trilogy of Westerns. They're called spaghetti Westerns because they're all shot um, in Italian. And then the lead is Clint Eastwood, who's American. And then so the American version and all the Italians are dubbed in English. And in Italy, Eastwood's dialogue is dubbed by an Italian. So he does that trilogy and those three movies hit big in the United States. And after that, for Clint Eastwood, done deal, movie star for 50 years. Now, if he hadn't gone to think about this, you're in Hollywood, you're working at the studios, you've grown up around it as a stuntman, you know all these people, they all know you, you're on friendly terms, you're in the door. You can get into a, a meeting with a producer, no problem. They employ you. But they don't want to put you, they think, they think he's kind of scraggly and tall and kind of unattractive and grizzly looking. And he's got this deep, weird voice and they don't know what to do with him. But then these three Westerns come out and make a quadrillion dollars. And then, you know, that's it. Yeah. Audiences want to spend time with a guy. And it worked out that that was true. So you could say, but Eastwood, like a lot of uh, actors were being offered films in um, Italy uh, at the time, particularly in Rome and saying, no, I won't do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, Feastwood had said no. And then the famous story is Eli Wallach, who, you know, had been on Broadway and Tony's and Academy Awards. And uh, Leon wanted him for the third Fistful movie. And w Wallach calls Eastwood and says, do I really want to do these crazy movies? And Eastwood says, for your career, trust me, go do the third movie. And so you see this Jew from Brooklyn playing this Mexican, oddly enough, a very reluctant Eli Wallach, a major actor in his day, Broadway star icon, um, doing this, the third one, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And he's brilliant in it. And it, you know, it really it catapults his stardom. It restarts his career. So I think sometimes it's what you, you say yes to. And I think sometimes it's people saying yes to things that like, like, Spinal Top is a great example of that, right? No one wanted to make that movie. Rob Reiner, Rob Reiner's father is Carl Reiner. He could not get his father to write, the, his own dad to write the check to make that movie. So he had enough money, he got together enough money, all those guys, and they made the first 20 minutes of it. You can see it on YouTube. It's the same movie, but it was done on 16 millimeter. 
And all the stuff that they shot on 60 millimeter ended up in the movie shot, reshot on 35, right? So they made 20 minutes of that movie and they, because they couldn't really pitch it. No one knew what they were trying to do. So they just went and they shot it with their own money and then they showed it around. And then Rob Reiner got that 20 minutes to film in front of his former boss, which was um, Norman Lear, because Rob Reiner was on All in the Family as Meathead. And 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 uh, and and um, Lear saw the footage, uh, fell out of his chair laughing, said this is hilarious, and gave him his money to go make his movie. And another fun story like that is the Zucker brothers, who maybe I don't know. Do you know like Airplane and The no. Naked Gun? So they're very very funny movies that came out in the 80s and 90s. That like I promise you, like my kids fall on the floor laughing. So th those guys were a part of an improv comedy troupe from Kentucky that ha set up shop to sold out audiences two blocks from the 20th Century Fox lot. And they were selling out and they could not get anyone from 20th Century Fox to come. They got great reviews in the LA Times. No one from Fox would come. And so finally, after two years, they like begged all their family members and shot 10 minutes of their show on film. They got that to an executive at Fox. He saw the 10 minutes. He reportedly fell out of his seat laughing. He said, well, I'll make your movie. And they made their first movie. It's called Kentucky Fried Movie. It's very funny. And that led to the airplane movies, which are classic and hysterical and very funny. That led to the Naked Gun movies, classic, hysterical, very funny. Um, so all these people in a way had to find, they can, you, you couldn't ultimately throw crazy money at the problem and fix it. I think Pia Zadora proves that. I don't know if you know who she is, but she's a very beautiful woman who sang and you could argue could act or not. That's a taste thing, but couldn't get a movie career. So she married this extraordinary wealthy guy who just wrote these checks for $20, $30 million to make movies for her. Um, that she starred in. And then the problem was that they ultimately sort of got Dina De Laurentiis through, I'm sure there was money involved, to release them and no one would go see them and the people that would see them would walk out because they just, so, you know, at some point, you know, you, you, you've got to de deliver to an, to an audience. But, you know, there's always usually, it's kind of like you were talking before about, um, dating, right? And Cinderella and Hollywood loves to tell that story about actors and writers and directors. But you, you know, you've got a, a six, seven, eight year old Steven Spielberg who loves to scare his sisters. So he will, he learns that he loves to get an emotional reaction and he begs his, his, his mom, not only for a film camera, but to be allowed to skip school to make movies. And she lets him. And so, you know, you hear Spielberg and he's 23 and he makes Jaws, 24, he almost got fired off that film. But what you don't hear about is 10 years, 12 years, by the time he's 13, 14 years old, he's making movies every week. Wow. So Jaws is going to come out pretty good because it's not his first rodeo. Yeah. That is crazy. What do you think um, about actors and the choices they make to prolong their career. So I'm thinking specifically, I'm comparing in my head, Adrian Brody to Leonardo DiCaprio. I believe Adrian Brody was the youngest guy ever, or even actor ever, to win an Oscar. But then you don't really hear much coming out of Adrian Brody being like a movie star in today's age who puts butts into seats. But Leonardo DiCaprio is one of those people that I can think of who isn't the traditional Rock Johnson, um, Tom Cruise type of movie star. He's the character actor kind of movie star who still puts butts into seats. Like, how does, you know, Leonardo make his career choices so well executed compared to other really great actors who just maybe went down the wrong hole? Well, great question. I, I have to ask you did, you, did you see the movie What Seed in Gilbert Grape? Yes. So you, so you saw Leonardo as a, a true character actor. Um, I think the answer is any more than studios for actors. They don't know. 
you, you know, you can, you can read they, 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 for a certain time when you're hot, you get, start to get offered more scripts than you can do and you pick and it uh, stars at a certain level and then have the power to get a movie made. Right. Tom Cruise says he wants to be in your movie. Your movie's going to get made, you know, literally it, it, it could be about, you know, decorating a Christmas tree. And if Tom says that he's going to show up, you're going to have a movie. Um, so I think it's, uh, in some cases, it might be smart management. Uh, in some cases, I think certain stars understand and get to figure out who their audience is over time. Uh, and again, I think it's a, a taste thing, too. So, you know, what, what star made him a, a, a big film star? It certainly wasn't Gilbert Grape. I mean, it, it got him on the radar but it, it didn't make him someone who could open a movie. I think it was Titanic. Well, there you go. So th there's a film that, you know, y you know, arguably a really badly written film that was that made a bazillion dollars and you had teenage women rewatching it multiple times, which is why it grows so much at the box office. So, um, y you know, I could easily see uh, it's, it's, if it weren't Cameron behind it, would you really even take Titanic if you were either of those guys? I mean, it's three and a half hours. It's about a sinking boat. It's a period piece, which is usually the death, right, of the box office. For some reason, again, the fickle public took a, a love to that story, which is really just a retelling of, it's Romeo and Juliet on a boat. That's what Titanic is, right? Uh, and beautifully filmed and conceived and, uh, you know, hats off to James Cameron for making that epic and making a film. But, you know, what if, what if Brody had said yes? And, you know, the, Hollywood is ripe with stories of people that turn down roles that become that role, right? Yeah. The Graduate, you get uh, uh, Robert Redford saying no thank you. Then you get Charles Grodin, who just has a career, but not a movie star career saying no to that. And then finally, Dustin Hoffman, who might not have had a career say, yeah, sure. And he's Dustin Hoffman. So I think part of it's just what the public is gonna uh, take a shining to. It, the, the, the only other story that, I, that comes to mind is Eddie Murphy. He's a really interesting case study. I mean, you have high class problems if you're 21 years old, you're living at home <laughs> and you're on Saturday Night Live and like you're America's favorite, right? Like you're gonna do okay. So he had a movie career that was gangbusters for a while, like Trading Places, I think was his first big screen, Beverly Hills Cop. And then all of a sudden, people don't remember, but there was about a five year period where his movies all just died, like no one went. Yeah. And because what had happened is he'd fired his agent and his manager and his brother was doing managing him and they were picking his projects. He, he the, the last film that was going to be his death now, he plays this American soldier who through an officer exchange program is in Israel driving a tank fighting in an Israeli war. And it's a comedy. So I can see the laughs already. That was like his going to be his last feature film. That was a major studio feature film with Eddie Murphy. That wasn't like some little, right? You had to get tanks and lots of, right? And then um, he said to his brother, you know, well, I'll take care of you, but I'm going to go back to my management. And they sat down and said, well, this is tough because you, your career is basically, your audience is gone. There isn't an audience to see Eddie Murphy movies anymore, which if you think about that statement is staggering given where he is now, right? Yeah. But that was just true. That was stone cold reality. And um, one, one of his managers said, you know, the only thing I can think of is let's approach Jerry Lewis and let's see if we can get the rights to his movies, which he produced, again, talk about self-generation. People don't realize Jerry Lewis, 40 movies, he wrote and directed all of them himself. Wow. Or co-wrote, 40. Jerry Lewis, uh, and the French find him very funny. So, you know, the studio was gonna make their money back and it all worked out. So they, they went to Jerry Lewis and they said, can we start, can we write you a big check? And um, the first one they bought from him was The Nutty Professor. Boom, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, Eddie Murphy's been back ever since, but he spent like five, six, seven years doing remakes of Jerry Lewis movies. Yeah, Eddie Murphy is really interesting. I heard him talk 
um, I think it was a SAG after conversation and he was talking and he said he improvises about 90% of his dialogue in movies. And that's just so crazy to think about from an actor's perspective where the script is kind of the Bible and that's the word you go by. And he comes in, not saying he's unprepared, but he comes in and he just does his own thing. And you love Eddie Murphy. When I go see an Eddie Murphy movie, I'm seeing an Eddie Murphy movie. I'm not seeing that character necessarily. I'm seeing Eddie Murphy and then that character. So it's very, he's a very interesting case study. But notice for five years that didn't work for him and he, he lost his public. The other thing is when movies shoot like that, they always shoot it as scripted and then improvise. So they have both in the can. And there's not very many performers that can do what he does um, in, in any sort of consistently effective way. There are some, but the, the, um, the, the majority of, of stuff is, is scripted. And um, I'm just trying to think, you know, there's a, a classic film, which everyone in the film business loves, and it really never made a great amount of money called Midnight Run with Charles Grodin and Robert De Niro. And it's considered a classic and it's well loved. It just never did crazy box office. It's a beautifully made movie and it's very funny because Grodin is just funny and um, it's a buddy film. And um, they shot the whole movie. Every scene was is written and then every scene was improvised. And then they edited together the best of the two. And that's the movie. And it's terrific because um, uh, uh, Robert De Niro is a very serious actor and he would never, he would, he, you couldn't get him to break character, right? Once he was in character, say, if something were to happen that was funny, he wouldn't laugh as that character while the camera was rolling. He, no one could ever get him to break. It was impossible. And so they had this bad, the producers offered Grodin some silly, crazy bonus if they could get Robert De Niro to break one time. And, and, and Grodin does it. It's in the train car scene. And I won't give away the punchline, but they're in a train car. You know, it's a typical, we're on the run. We've jumped into the empty train car. We're in the hay having a fight. And Charles Grodin says something to him. And in the react, the look, it's, it's, it's really kind of out there what he says anyway. It's so unexpected. And the look on De Niro's face, it looks like it's planned and it's very funny. But what you're really seeing is Robert De Niro breaking character. He's so stunned at what Charles Grodin has just improvised to him. He can't, you know, he's just like, and he's like trying not to laugh. And of course, the, he didn't want to put it in the movie. And of course, they put it in the movie because <laughs> Grodin got him to break. Oh, my God. You know, you told me a story about The Graduate and how Dustin Hoffman got that role. Can you reiterate when he was um, just a nobody actor in a theater and how he went and got that role? Because that is a crazy story. And I've never heard that before. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely true. And if you want to read it um, in sort of incredible detail, you can read it in Charles Grodin's all, always recommended read because he's just so bloody funny. He wrote a book about acting called It Would Be So Nice If You Weren't Here, which is literally what someone said to him in his acting career, <laughs> this British woman. It would be so nice if you weren't here. Um, so yeah, what happened was... Uh, Mike Nichols and Elaine May were these very famous uh, team of Elaine May. They were huge, selling out on Broadway. The team broke up. Um, and I actually had part of that story wrong. I always thought Nichols had left May. May is the one that broke the team up. So Nichols figured out after much um, depression that he wanted to direct and could direct. And he started to direct on Broadway and he was just the golden boy. He was directing Neil Simon plays. And so he was directing plays that were running forever. I want to have a tag to the graduate story. I have a really funny end. I have a new story to that story. So it's funny that you would ask me. So Mike Nichols is the golden boy. He's going to direct his first movie. He can direct any comedy he wants because all in America is dying. The, the teams just broke up. They miss him. They miss Elaine May. They, they, everyone knows who he is. They recognize. So he's like a star and now he's a director, but people say he can still do talk shows and be funny. Talk about why Nichols May isn't, right? So we still got that cachet too. And he picks out of any project, he, he, he picks The Graduate. Now, if you read the book of The Graduate, um, other than the line about 
plastics um, and the hotel scene, which gets played by Buck Henry. Uh, interesting, right? Because Buck Henry did the screenplay from the book and he wrote himself into the movie. And then there's the line about plastics. Otherwise, not to take anything away from the tremendously talented Buck Henry, the movie of The Graduate is the book. It's as if they just took the book and filmed it. The dialogue, the pictures, the everything, other than the Simon and Garfunkel's brilliant songs that went with it, it's all right there in the book. So you could read the book and you could read the screenplay and you could have some suspicion just based on the fact that Mike Nichols was gonna make this thing, that it was, it was at least gonna do okay, right? So Nichols had seen Robert Redford, who was not a movie star yet, do Barefoot in the Park, because um, he'd been directing Neil Simon plays. That's a Neil Simon play. And he, he offered it to Robert Redford. And Redford said, uh, let me read it. And Redford read it, called Nichols back and said, um, he, he, in a, a modest, humble way, he's like, you know, my career's going pretty good on Broadway. And I've had people ask me to do some films. And I don't know how all this is going to come out. But um, with a graduate, I'm going to have to say no to you. And Mike Nichols is like, what are you crazy? Did you not read the script? Did you not? And, and Robert Ruffer says, no, no, I get it. He said, it's, it's a phenomenal opportunity. But do, do you think that anyone watching The Graduate, looking at me in America, is going to believe that I'm a virgin? <laughs> and Mike Nichols says, oh, my gosh, you're right. You would ruin the movie. And Robert said, I know I would. So, you know, good luck. They stayed friends all these years. But he said, no, nah, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So then, like, who, you've got this film and who are you going to get? So there's this comic actor named Charles Grodin who comes very close to stealing um, Heaven Can't Wait from Warren Beatty. He's just very funny. And, and he he gets these supporting roles. And But he'd done television for years. And he he, he was sort of... He, he was sort of very, he, he describes himself as being bitter. And um, he gets offered the graduate and he says, he reads it and he's like, oh my God, I, I'm, of course I'm going to do this. And, um, and then he, he says to Nichols, just have your, you know, the studio call my agent and they'll work something out. And then it gets back to Grodin that because the script is so hot, because it's Mike Nichols, that it's going to pay minimum which is like half or a third of what Grodin expected to make, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of like a million dollars, it was like $200,000, which to us, you know, sounds pretty good, right? But, and Grodin said, oh, they're bluffing. Redford had already said, no, they need me. Uh, I'm not gonna, and they weren't bluffing. They really, they just, they weren't gonna, because the studio wasn't so sure. Like Nichols was pretty sure, the producers were pretty sure, but, they weren't going to pay anyone anything other than minimum. And Grodin got the call. They've, 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 they've said they've moved on. They, you're never, they, it was never negotiable. Sorry. And then they send it to, um, to um, Dustin Hoffman, who had literally uh, been in plays at a, a theater that I worked with and an artistic director and coach that I worked with named Wynn Hanman, had worked with Wynn. And, and uh, Dustin Hoffman was, he thought he was too old for it. Um, that was the concern there. Um, but he was in. And then that movie comes out. And then the new story that I heard that I love about that uh, uh, film is, I forget the studio executive, but I just heard the story because there's a documentary that you can watch right now. Uh, it's with Mike Nichols. You can just hear him telling stories for two hours. It's about a documentary with the great director, Mike Nichols, of stage and screen, one of the best directors of our lifetime, who directed The Graduate. And um, the guy who, I forget who it was, but the studio executive, um, they screened it for the studio executive, right? Like they had a rough cut and they were screening it and there were like 10 or so people on the movie sitting. And the executive would always sit near the front, but he wouldn't let anyone sit in front of him so that he didn't want anyone to see the look on his face. And he watched the entire movie and he didn't say anything. He didn't laugh. It's a very funny movie. He was there and everyone is staring at the guy, right? Because he's going to decide how many movie screens, the advertising budget, all that, right? It's going to depend. That guy has the power to shelf it if he wants to. So that studio executive is sitting there, legendary executive is sitting there. He's completely silent. He does not laugh at a very funny movie, nothing, no reaction, nothing. And the lights come up 
and he doesn't even turn. He just, they hear him say, his voice just say one sentence. He said, I smell a lot of money here. And then he walked out of the room and that was, you know, they put a bunch of money into the advertising and that, he was right. But, yeah. you know, it could have got released. No one could, what if no one had liked that movie? You might see Dustin Hoffman on Broadway, off Broadway. I don't know if you'd be seeing him in movies. That movie made him a movie star. And if you looked at him, he wasn't a traditional in any sense of the word leading man at all. Yes. And then from there, you know, he does Marathon Man and he does all the President's Men and then he's Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman goes through a period where he can't work because he's so difficult. That's true. Yeah, I've heard that. So what does he do? He, he hires Larry Gelbert to write a script about an actor that can't get any work. <laughs> and that's Tootsie. Oh my God. That was written for him. So he plays a difficult actor, but he's really just playing... Was Tootsie after Kramer and Kramer? Yep. Okay. For sure. And what, what, like, I've always heard he was difficult to work with, but what does that mean? Like, well, so if you, if you watch the interviews with Meryl Streep and Dustin Hoffman even admits to the fact that he, well, Meryl Streep, um, she was doing two movies simultaneously. She was doing Kramer versus Kramer and a, a Woody Allen movie called Manhattan. She was being driven between the two. And she said he was, he, he was, he was bringing up, she was going through a divorce and um, in real life. And Hoffman had found out all this very personal information about that. And while the camera was rolling, he would say that stuff to her to get reactions. Now they both tell that story. So I got to believe if both of them are going to say that in a documentary, it's true. But the story that, that, that Streep says that then Hoffman admits to, he kind of like smiles and he doesn't want to admit it, but then he admits it, is there's a scene in the movie where little Billy is supposed to cry, this little four-year-old actor is supposed to cry, and they just can't get the kid to cry. You know, you've got a hundred crew members and, you know, they've got to get the shot and it's hours and he just won't cry. So the kid had gotten very attached to like, uh, uh, to, to Dustin Hoffman and the director, and he, he, he goes up to this kid and he's like, um, he's like, um, y y y y y you know, like, um, you know, movies kind of unlike real life, like after this movie's over, that director over there and me, you're never going to see us ever again. And in fact, after today, you're never going to see me for the rest of your life. And the camera was rolling when he said that and the kid started crying. So literally Hoffman said that to a four-year-old in order to get the shot. So yeah. like, I don't know, man, I, I, you, maybe you want that guy on your set and maybe you don't. I mean, Meryl Streep clearly did not. Um, she jokes about it now, but clearly he was just horrible to her to get, she could act, she could get there anyway, but he felt he had to push her. So when you see Meryl Streep crying in those scenes, she's really crying, it's not acting. He said stuff to her that's just that upsetting that obviously doesn't end up on the screen. Yeah. So his MO is that he not only um, focuses on his performance, he focuses on telling all the actors what to do. And so there's a famous story about um, the one person he wouldn't do it to was on Marathon Man with Olivier. So he was telling Roy Scheider how to act but he wouldn't tell Sir Lawrence Olivier how to act. And there's this very funny story about how somehow Roy Schneider got Olivier to intercede for him so that Hoffman would stop giving Schneider notes mm. uh, off camera. So, you know, if you can get Dustin Hoffman in your movie, you're doing okay in life. But I think if you're a fellow actor, I don't know if it's gonna be a happy experience, unless you like getting directed from another actor and, you, you, and if you're supposed to cry, he's gonna, I mean, this is, listen, I'm not talking out of school. You can see him admitting to this in a, in a documentary. And I believe that documentary is on the extras version of Kramer versus Kramer. Wow. I'm surprised these actors don't, like, he seems very micromanaging. They don't tell him to quit it. And I don't know. Well, they have. When he did Death of a Salesman, the famous story is uh, John Malkovich playing his son, Biff. And... 
Arthur Miller is literally on the set. You know, they're making, a, I think it had been made into a movie. They're remaking it. But it's the movie that people remember of the play. But, you know, 20, 30 years after its Broadway debut, they're making it with, with, with Dustin Hoffman and, and uh, Malkovich's Biff, which is a classic part. And uh, Malkovich, the way Malkovich can be, he just starts screaming in front of the entire crew, like as loud as he possibly can to Hoffman. With Arthur Miller standing right there, he's like, um, he's like, you're Dustin Hoffman. You're, you're Dustin, Arthur Miller is right here. Arthur Miller, if he has some notes for me, that, that okay, but he doesn't. But do you, you really have notes for me? Because if you have notes for me, I think everybody should hear these notes. And Hoffman was so embarrassed because Miller was there. He just starts mumbling and apologizing. And then he stopped noting him for the rest of the film. Wow. So yeah, M Malkovich pushed back, but he's the only example I know of someone that successfully with Miller as leverage in the, <laughs> on there, the day. Is there uh, like a fear? Because Dustin Hoffman is such a well-known actor that if you push back at some guy of that position of power, because Hollywood is just a bunch of relationships, it seems like, and you form a bad relationship with a star that you could be blackballed. Is that why you think some people don't push back? Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone wants the reputation to be difficult on a movie, movie set. And, and it, if you think about Tootsie at all, you realize that even a Dustin Hoffman, a star of that magnitude, did tremendous damage for a period of time and possibly ended his own career. So, you, you know, Stars don't get to misbehave until they're stars. And then if they do, they get away with it. But a lot of them don't. And um, circling back to Tom Cruise, he has, um, he has a, uh, index cards made, flash cards made, with a picture of every person on the crew and then their name. And he will address every single person on that crew, production assistants, gaffers, the guy with the walkie-talkie watching the gear by their first name. He's the first person on the set. He's the last person to leave. He always tries to have um, talk to people on the crew. He always will like do anything. He's like, we're all here to make a good movie. And I have to make sure that it's a good experience for everyone. So that's a smart, and he, he produces his own movies, right? That's a smart businessman. Now, I think he probably remembers what it was like to get up at four in the morning and have to unload um, a can a good set for a grocery store. That was, you know, when he was struggling as an actor, that was his day job. Um, but I think he also ultimately gets, by creating a happy set, A, it's the right thing to do, and B, he's treating everyone like human beings, and no surprise, like on the Mission Impossible movies, those crews are known for pushing really hard to get tough shots. Well, why did they do that for him? Because he gets to know their name and he's nice to them. So, you know, and he's Tom Cruise, he doesn't have to do that. And I tell people that story and I like, I'll meet someone and they're like, oh yeah, I, I worked at a TV station in Rochester and he flew in on a helicopter and I took him into the studio and he asked me my name and talked to me and, yeah. you know. He, he so, seems like a really good guy from what I've heard. So, you know, his private life is his private life. But if you get on a movie set with him, you're going to be, he's going to know who you are and he's going to treat you nicely. And that's just good business. So again, Hollywood likes stories about, they, we like to sort of make our movie stars gods and then we like to tear them down and build them back up again. So, you, you know, Christian, the fact that Christian Bale is very difficult on the movies is endlessly interesting to people. But I just feel bad for the people working on the movies because they have to deal with it. We don't know it when we're watching the films. And now in this day and age, going back to your technologies everywhere, where we started, you have people leaking clips of people misbehaving. Yeah. And so maybe it'll come full circle and people will behave again. But... Um, do you think it's necessary? Now I'm playing devil's advocate for the difficult actors perspective to get the best performance out of everybody that in their head, the best way to make the best film is to do the unthinkable, like Stanley Kubrick in The Shining, I heard tormented that lead actress. I don't remember her name. And, and Cheryl Duvall, and she said that she, it's the best direction and performance she's ever done in her life. And the thing she's most proud of 
And at the same time, she hates him for having done it, but she loves him for having done it. But the thing about Kubrick is people say genius all the time. But like he took this test, he was like one of the smartest five people on the planet when he took his IQ. I mean, he was, he was different on every film with every actor. Uh, he directed uh, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and, and got Nicole Kidman to cry uh, by keeping her up for 24 hours. And she was glad he did it. So generally speaking, I would say it's probably a really bad idea. You're not, Hitchcock was known to be really horrible to the women in his films. On the other hand, I could purport to you that the women in his films didn't necessarily drive the movies uh, as much as the leading man. Um, and he certainly had many women say they won't work with him as a result. So um, I could all, I would just purport that I think that Kramer versus Kramer, given the writing, given the directing, given the level of, you know, you've got, you've literally got that actress in that script. Um, uh, and she's not even in the movie very much, right? It's basically the, it's basically a one man show between Dustin Hoffman and the little boy. Dustin Hoffman has 80% of the lines in that movie. So I would purport to you, he could have done nothing. He was really, what he's doing is he's being a bully and he's doing the director's job. And the director on Kramer was known for being incredibly actor friendly and a sweet man. So he wasn't doing any of that stuff to anyone, including Hoffman. So you can easily make the argument that that film could have been just as good or even better. Maybe Street would have even gotten more vulnerable had she not been pushed into being bullied and told these horrible things. Maybe she would have trusted him even further and shown us in the early, you know, that she, the relationship was, we don't, that's kind of unknowable. I mean, yeah, he tricked the kid into crying, okay. But it might've been a better movie without it. Um, I don't think it would have been a worse movie. Like, I don't think he suddenly, because Dustin Hoffman did that. I think Dustin Hoffman got to bully people and he, he felt in control and in charge. Um, or why else would one do that, right? But I don't, I, I could purport to you that it would have been an equally successful film. And, um, y you know, it, the script's good or it's not, the actors are getting or it's not, and no one knows if it's gonna come together, there'd be something special or not, not usually. So, I, you know, it, when stars become stars, if they want to, they can get away with it and you can look and read who it does. And then other, actors are just perfectly nice so i don't i don't think there's a correlation i think in the long run you just sort of risk your employability because at some point people just say life is too short i was in a situation like that i can't name who it was it's someone who's won many tony awards can't i'm not even gonna say if it's a man or a woman and we had them because the director of our show had given them their first job ever in new york and, and the director had become fairly famous himself, Tony nominated director. And um, we had this person dead to right. She, now I said it's a woman, but that's not really gonna narrow it down. So we had this woman and we met with her and I was utterly charmed and I was like young and I'm like to these guys, including the guy who was gonna write the check for the show. Um, uh, this guy who produces Broadway shows all the time and the, the, the guys all looked at each other and they said to the director, life is too short. We just, we, we, we're not going to deal with this. We're not going to, it's great. She wanted to do it. Yes. If she, cause what we knew was if he, she said, yes, we'd be sold out for six months before we opened. Right. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a business where 95 to 98% of Broadway shows lose money, that's a hell of a financial guarantee. You're going to break even. And in fact, the show, so we, they passed on her. They literally, they politely, I don't know how they did it, but they passed. And then another set of producers snatched her up, put her in a show, uh, which was a huge hit and ran, is still running, ran for decades. And it opened on the strength of her. Yeah. But the, so there were these other producers that were happy to put up with that. And the fact that this person was known to be incredibly difficult, not just during rehearsal, but over a period of a run. And in this case, they were stuck with that performer because this performer stayed with that show for three, four years. Yeah. You know? And so if you want to, so, you know, sh that person did fine at the end of the day, but I have to wonder if they wouldn't have been a bigger star star in the movie world 
if, if that, you know, MO had it. Because people aren't being gossipy at this point. It's just practical. You know what I mean? Like, you want to know if you're going to have to spend six months or a year with someone. Are they going to be easy to be around? Are they going to be nice to the other performers? Or are they going to have lots of drama and threaten to storm out before the curtain rises and all sorts of lunacy? Um, and you just, you, you, you just, at some point, you just, these guys were just like, we don't, you know, we're in our 50s. I was in my 20s. And they're like, you know, we're only going to be producing for so much longer. We don't, we don't need this anymore. And you so I, I think over the long run, that, that show that I worked on, we got a, a, a star, uh, a, a male star in a different part who's worked forever and couldn't have been nicer. You know, you, I, go, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, I, I completely agree with you. You're going to be on set for a long time. And I don't know much beyond seeing Tom Hardy act, but he did a remake of Mad Max. I believe it's called Mad Max Fury Road. And I heard there was a lot of tension between him and uh, Charlize Theron, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, on set. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand it really stemmed from the pressure of making a huge remake of Mad Max and it falling on the shoulders of Tom Hardy to where he became very frustrated and hard to work with on that set. Do you know any other examples of actors kind of maybe, I'm not saying he cracked under pressure. I think he delivered a great performance and the whole end product came out great, but the weight of a movie being on a leading actor's shoulders getting to them? Well, I think that's why they get paid 20 million bucks, right? Or 10 million bucks. Like that's the deal at Hello. So, you, you know, I don't think you, you take an actor who's been acting for a year or two or three and done some small parts in movies and let them carry a, a, a hundred million dollar uh, a classic feature remake. I, you know, I don't know what he had done before that. I don't know what, how the director and him got along. I don't know how she and him got along. Got along. Um, but, y you know, I think part of why you would pay Eddie Murphy's, uh, you know, 50 million or whatever, he makes some movies probably 30 and a, a percentage of the box office, um, is you know he's gonna carry the movie and he's not gonna crack. Um, there's certainly been in the history of films, particularly when the studio system was in existence, stars could get replaced in early shooting. That happened occasionally. Um, and that was a director stu or studio head call. And that still can and does happen. I mean, not to be a bummer, but, or, you know, cause it's just all sad, but, um, you know, literally look at what happened to, um, uh, uh, well, uh, Kevin Spacey. I mean, you know, that movie was in the can yes. and they said, we're not releasing this movie with him in it. And they reshot it and he's not, it's Richard, it's um, Richard, it's Richard Plummer. Is that who plays the, all the money in the world, right? Yeah. So at some point, but yeah, I don't think, I think this, if you're an executive, you're going to green light a film and then you're going to, if you're going to put an unknown actor in a major role, I think you've got to know you're taking a, chance not not because they're unknown but because they're untested i mean that's i mean it looks all very glamorous but that's really go out and make that movie yeah. that's that's hard and dangerous work over a long period of time with no sleep and so i don't know about you but if i had a hundred million dollars in a movie i would want someone who had done started out doing some smaller stuff you know the original uh, mad max movies that very first one was done with mel gibson that was done on a shoestring budget and he was completely unknown he was uh shakespearean trained most people don't realize he'd gone to the school in australia the same one nicole came and went to the trained actors uh, to do Shakespeare. And then the other fun story about the very first Mad Max film is they were so into it, they convinced the military to let them put a, a heat seeking missile underneath and strap it underneath the car. And they set the missile off to make the car go flying. Wow. And there was a stunt guy in that car 
when it sort of takes off into the air and leaps and you know, you just see it sort of go very fast and you see this flash of light. And what people don't realize is that that's a government grade military missile that the stunt people have rigged to go off under the car because they're so into making that movie. And the very first movie, it's like it was ahead of its time it, when I first saw it, I was sort of blown away, no pun intended. But if you watch it now, it feels very dated. But that, but Mel Gibson was no movie star when he made the first one. It made him a star. He is, his first one, he still has his accent. Yeah. He, he's got the Aussie accent. He hasn't been told to lose it. It's this sort of low-budget car chase movie set in the apocalypse. No one knows it's going to be what it's going to be. You know, and then, you know, he sort of says he goes off and after that he does a lethal weapon and then that's it, the one, one, two punch. And then he goes back to do uh, some more Mad Max movies. He loses the accent. He does a lot of vocal training. There's a lot more training for film, very consciously sets about it to be a better film actor and really studies how to do that. But the fact that this kid that's studying at a, um, he, I think he was literally at school when they shot that movie and he was like off for the summer. And can you imagine you're in acting school and these guys say, we want to do the, and you read Mad Max and, but like it's, you don't know that it's going to be Mad Max. You just read this sci-fi thing and there's all this torture in it and death and it, the, the world is this sort of dysutopia and this is before dysutopia is popular right so it's really ahead of its time and you're just reading it you got to be thinking like well okay it's the summertime and i get to drive some fast cars and no one's ever going to see this so what the heck it'll pay for my acting school next year and he didn't know mm -hmm. no one knew yeah no one yeah yeah. Until you put it in front of people on the screens in Australia, and then it went crazy, and then they started to put it on screens in America, and then around the world, and all of a sudden, now you've got Mel Gibson. But people, again, how many people would be able to tell you he's a classically trained Shakespearean actor who put in that work? Not many. Right? He, he's an interesting guy. He's a very interesting guy. You know, Martin Scorsese came out and said Marvel movies and superhero movies are ruining yeah. movie theaters. Do you agree with his opinion on that, that this huge rise in superhero movies is ruining it for other smaller movies that can't get into the movie theaters because more of the screens are being filled with these superhero movies? Well, I think it's ruining it for Martin Scorsese. So he's, <laughs> he's, not, he's not being a very happy uh, party goer, but you know, the same Mar Marty Scorsese would be the first to, you know, his first movie was made for a guy named Roger Corman, who's the king of B movies. And Martin Scorsese's first movie, which is fine for a B movie that was made for no money is called Boxcar Bertha. So, you know, I don't, you know, I, and I think that Scorsese would be the first one to say that there was an era in the movie studios in the 40s when, say, Universal and monster movies dominated. Frankenstein, Dracula, The Mummy. And then you had, you know, Ab and Costello do their versions. But really they were doing, for, you know, five years it was those movies. And if you wanted to do a serious drama and the studio had to decide between, you know, a cop, and then there was a time that was Scorsese would have loved in Hollywood, the the gangster film for about ten years, the golden age of the gangster film, and sort of the the the, the roaring twenties and into the depression, you know. And then there was a period where you know they couldn't get Godfather; they had a very hard time getting Godfather made, which is a Scorsese film, kind of a film if you think about it. So I think. He's a very smart guy. He's a very talented director, but I think he's just probably a little frustrated now that his kind of movie isn't what's in movie theaters. And when gangster movies were, and I don't think he was complaining and saying, oh, it's all gangster movies. We don't have any other, we don't have any, you know, we don't have any family dramas. We don't have any action stories. We don't have any Westerns, you know, it's, it's all gangster, which by the way, gangster stories are just Westerns set in a city. So the idea that gangsters, gangster stories is a new form is not true. But um, having said that, um, I can't imagine he was very happy when Star Wars came out either, you know? So, 
you know, it's whatever the market will bear. And I, I, I you know, I, I'm tired of, of superhero movies. I'll be very happy never to see another one. But if I was running a studio and I was responsible for stockholders' investments, I'd be making them. Be my job. And at some point, audiences will get tired of them. I know it sounds like it's never going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah, ebbs and flows. You, your grandchildren, if you if you you so willing and have them, will not be going to superhero movies, or maybe they will all over again. I maybe don't know. Be in a superhero movie with the whole virtual reality. <laughs> but, but between now and then, it'll become something else, whatever that something else is. And you know, these the superhero franchises are starting to have tr trouble, right? They're starting to have to hybrid with each other and mix and match to get people interested to keep going. Yeah, and they're, running, they're running out of story, even though there's 40, 50 years of comic book story to draw from. And Stan Lee's passed away. Mm -hmm. You know, everything has its time and its place. And when he was making those comic books, he didn't know it was going to become what it became decades later. He had no idea. No one knew. Or you, you would have bought, but we want to Stan Lee and say, I want to be a partner in Marvel Comics. No one wanted that job, other than people that love to read comic books that never grew up and went and made comic books for him. You, you, can you imagine someone graduating first in their class at Harvard and saying, I'm not going to law school, I'm gonna go work for this company that makes these comic books in 1950? No. For this guy named Stan Lee and they're in like Brooklyn in like this rooftop space that's like, you know, freezing in the winter and hot in the summer and they're drawing these comic books that get printed in limited runs? No. Like, can you imagine that kid now getting out and saying, oh, you know, Marvel's looking for a CEO. They want a 22-year-old. Yeah, they go. Yeah. But, but you know, you, the, you, no one knew. So, I, you know, I don't know what's going to be next. But I, I know that ultimately, the, 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 as much power studios have, you can never pay people to show up and sit in a movie seat. You just can't. And ultimately over time, the audience, and now a world audience, not just an American audience, a world audience is having a, a great deal to say about this. So it's a really interesting time. Like right now you're running a studio you want, you were talking about minority actors. I'm running a studio, I definitely want one of my lead characters to be Asian. It's a no brainer. Yeah, you would think. Um, I'm not going to not make a movie and, and release it in the world without that being true. And is that really fair to the actor that actors that were not Asian that auditioned for that part? I don't know. But well, they're making, you know, their studios are making multiple versions of movies where they're making the part larger. For instance, that it's going to be released in China. So the Chinese character has longer scenes and more lines. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 you know, I wish, and I, I don't know the industry very well, but I would wish it would be who's the best actor, despite the race, despite anything, put the best actor in there if it makes sense for the story. I think that's true, but I think, and not to be remotely discouraging to my heroes are actors, I'm still friends with my best friend from kindergarten who is an actor. Well, most of the important and significant people in my life have been and are actors. But the thing that actors don't see, and it's, it's and, and I don't mean this in a, in, a, in a mean way, is that there, there, there are a lot of actors that are like, okay to good, right? But when you get to the point where you have $5 million, $10 million to spend on a movie, which is not a lot these days, right? There's just a lot of really good actors. And so then to say you're gonna get the best actor for the part becomes very tricky because if I've got $10 million and I can go out to LA and hire a casting person and pay that lead a million of my budget, I'm gonna have three, four really, really talented. They might not be famous yet, but they're gonna be super talented now. I think that you can make a mistake and the mistake one can make is you can confuse acting ability for stars. Star, a, a star is someone who audiences just like to spend time with and they don't care if they can act or not or they don't seem to notice, right? And then there are actors that can just seriously act and audiences don't 
particularly necessarily say, oh, I want to go see that movie because so-and-so's in it. I just hear it's really good, and then that person's really good. And then there's that rare actor that's both, right? They, 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 they can really seriously act. They've seriously, so you, you'd have to put Pacino. You put Meryl Streep in that category, a, a beautiful woman, not traditionally movie star looking. Just an incredibly talented actor. But I would say, and, and so people get confused because there are people that are charismatic or look a certain way, which the studios or the producers feel are going to sell tickets from the poster alone. And they know their markets are not necessarily wrong. You put certain actors on a poster in certain countries, movie studios can predict to the dollar what the minimum that movie is going to do. So it becomes that, and that's not, you know, why, why is it that audiences love to hang out? And no one knew it was true until they knew. Why is it audiences to this day apparently love to hang out with Clint Eastwood? And why Elliot Gould, not as much 40 years later. They'll still watch him, but it, it right, and Gould was like in the 60s, you can go to see a movie that Elliot Gould was in. He was right for his time. So it's, I think in theater, as a theater producer, I'd always cast the best actor. I think in film, I would always cast the actor that I would feel the audience would be most compelled to watch and root for. And I don't think that's necessarily technically the best actor by a long shot. They're not mutually, in, can, in a way, they're completely disconnected. If that maybe one might want to apply logic, oh, a really good actor must be able to do this, or vice versa. But I don't think that's true. I just think there's certain people in a certain role, and you would root for that character, and there are other people in that role, and you wouldn't root for them. And Hollywood movies are based around the fact that the audience is going to root for the main characters. That's it. If you're not rooting for the main characters within five minutes, you're done, you're toast. I don't care how good the movie is. So it's just a different thing. And I think, I think it gets very confusing because people watch film actors and some of it's real craft and some of it's, um, I mean, I really, I wanna see, I think Tom Hanks is a fine actor and there are people that would tell me he's brilliant. I, I personally, Tom, if you're listening, hi Tom, a friend of mine used to work for him. Um, literally was his assistant for years. I don't think he's a brilliant actor. I just don't. I think he's a funny comedian. I think audiences love to be with him. I think he was wonderful in Forrest Gump. But like, would I want to see him do Shakespeare? Or if I had, if I could only pick one actor to do all of 37 of Shakespeare's plays, would I pick Tom Hanks? No. After like play number three, I'd, you know, I, I wouldn't live through it. I'd dive off the balcony head first. Does that mean he's not a wonderful movie star? Or he's not great in the films he's in? No, he's, he's wonderful in Saving Private Ryan. And, but, you know, um, I'm just trying to think of a more classically trained, like, so uh, um, uh, Hannibal Lecter. So um, um, is, tell me his name, it's Sir... Anthony Hopkins. Hopkins. All 37 of Shakespeare's plays, we have Anthony Hopkins in the room. Okay, I'm there. <laughs> it's going to be really interesting, right? Now, is Hopkins or, or Hanks, are they one better than the other? No. If you're a movie producer, you actually, in Anthony Hopkins' day, when he was a younger guy, he was kind of a star. People don't remember, but in the 60s, he was. Uh, and then it's with, you know, Lecter that he comes back, quote unquote, and he just keeps doing Shakespeare's whole life. But for that, for a time there, he was kind of a Tom Hanks. He was sort of a more, he played more um, dramatic characters than you put Hanks in, I think. But I think you could easily, if you looked at a young Anthony Hopkins, he easily could have been put in Forrest Gump if you had a time machine. So... Is Tom Hanks uh, untalented or not hardworking or he has fabulous taste? He develops a lot of his own projects now. He's a smart guy. He's a likable guy. His best friend, as everyone knows, is literally Steven Spielberg. They and their wives hang out together every day. This is not a bad best friend to have. And, I'm, and I hear from my friend who worked for him, he's super nice. But having said that, I don't want to see his King Lear. That makes sense. You know, maybe someone does, 
and maybe it'll be brilliant. I, I would love to be wrong. I'm not like, you know, it's like I mean, Tom Cranks, you cannot be King Lear. Of course he can. And maybe he'd be an amazing Lear. What do I know? He'd be wonderful. And But put him as the narrator in Thornton Wilder's classic, uh, Our Town. He'd be brilliant. Gosh, yeah. He'd be brilliant as the narrator who, who's sort of this New England guy next door, likable, chimney stewardish. If you think about it, these archetypes don't go away. Tom Hanks really is playing the roles that Jimmy Stewart would have played. Yeah. You know, but again, would you want to have seen Jimmy Stewart as King Lear? It's a good point. And I think Stewart, and I think Stewart was pretty brilliant. Like if you look at him in some of, some of those Hitchcock films, um, you know, Stewart, he could do comedy. He could he could be very versatile. He could he could hit the emotional notes. He did have that quirky voice, and that distinctive look. But you could put him in a, a film like uh, Vertigo or Rear Window, and he could be brilliant. But I just can't imagine again. And there's no utility. Look, how many people want to go see King Lear every year, compared to how many people want to go see the new Star Wars movies? But I could also argue you that Star Wars is based on King on King Lear and the father and who, who's going to inherit the kingdom. And none of it's changed. It's just been repackaged and sent in outer space. Yeah. You know. Well, Martin, I would really like to appreciate you talking with me on the first podcast ever. You've been great. You've been a great guest. Um, you have so much interesting things to say. So I really appreciate you sharing it with us. If anyone listening would want to get in contact with you, what how would they best do that oh it's the easiest thing in the world just go to google and type in martin blank and the first thing that you're going to see is uh the hitman from the movie gross point blank which is a sore point with me but not really <laughs> um the john cusack you owe me lunch and the movie poster and you know that's true because i've had people tell you um no you just type my name in playwright and then there's a playwriting site that has all my plays and then it has contact information and they can contact and jay thank you for because i tend to talk a lot so thank you for being such a good listener and a good friend and it's always great talking to you and always interesting to hear your perspective because i totally consider you the sort of very smart you are very smart and you are the next sort of big generation that's going to influence and shape how our world's going to be in 10, 15 years. So in a lot of ways, a lot of the things that you're asking, you're going to be the one to have those answers someday. It's not going to be, I'm not going to have the vote. You're going to be the one to decide those things. And you're <laughs> going to be one of those people. So I look forward to seeing what the future holds for you. I feel it's going to be great in many ways. Wow. Thank you so much for the kind words. Thank you for your time, Martin. Thank you.